from Earl E. Wilson Stadium on the campus of UNLV, this is another edition of Hustlin' Rebels Baseball. Hello, everybody. Happy St. Patrick's Day, and welcome into the Sunday series finale between UNLV and Santa Clara. Matt Neverett along with Dan Dolby here on a beautiful Sunday afternoon as UNLV looks to complete a brief two-game sweep against the Santa Clara Broncos. Rebels winners by a 5-0 score yesterday. Game that featured 25 strikeouts in total, 15 of them between Austin Cates and Jesus Gonzalez. And uh, Dan, the Hustlin' Rebels pitching has been a lot more fortuitous this year. They've done a great job of not only limiting opponents, but really showing their dominance in the starting role, getting a ton of strikeouts. And Sam Simon hopes to keep that going today. Yeah, we talked about the six-game losing streak that Hustlin' Rebels were on. They were able to come out last night with a dominant pitching duo from Austin Cates and Jesus uh, Gonzalez. They're looking to keep that thing going today with Sam Simon on the mound, who's also been one of the stalwarts for the Hustlin' Rebels. They'll be looking to limit the Broncos, as they did last night, only getting five hits, keeping them off the scoreboard. But Sammy's ready to go, and uh, this would be a good way to go into the midweek against St. Mary's and then a conference series next week against Reno. Sam Simon, the six foot two, 200 pound right-hander out of Centennial High School in Vegas, making his fifth start of the year. So far, so good for Sammy. He's 2 0 with a 2 4 9 ERA. Rocking the black tops today, the white pinstripe pants with the black caps. Santa Clara in the maroon tops with the gray road pants. Sam Simon in four games has struck out 17 batters to just nine walks and in 25 and a third innings, allowing just a 2 11 batting average against Simon. Phenomenal in his fourth year with the program. UNLV 10 and 7 and 6 and 2 here at Early Wilson Stadium. Santa Clara enters the game 10 and 6 on the year. They have not played a WCC opponent yet. They are 3 and 5 when playing away from the friendly confines. John John Baring, the left-handed batting designated hitter to lead things off, hitting 379 on the year, 10 steals and 11 tries as well. He is a blazing hot runner on the base pass. First pitch downstairs from Simon, and we're underway at 12.09 local time. 60 degrees. Beautiful Sunday afternoon here on St. Patrick's Day. Wind swirling, but blowing softly in as we speak. Simon's 1-0, and there for a called strike, Joseph Penna. Calling balls and strikes behind home plate today. Alberto Ruiz, the crew chief, behind first base. Brooks O'Hearn across from him at third. And Jay Asner, the second base umpire, rounds out the quartet of umpires. A swing and a miss from Baring, and the count goes 1-2. Set the defense behind Sam Simon. Bailey Seeger, the only defender in front of him doing the catching and filling up the battery. And one two pitch, hit weakly on the ground to third, charging his Ditmar. Third baseman's got it, but no throw to first. Bearing a blazing hot runner is safe on an infield base hit. No chance for Ditmar at third, and Bearing leads the game off with the single. Austin Krizik at first, JP Heft and Paul Myro at second and short, the double play tandem up the middle. The outfield left to right for the Rebels, a familiar sight. Santino Panaro, Ryland Charles, and Kate Higgins. Nobody out and a runner on here in the top of the first. Here's Coleman Brigman, right-handed batting center fielder. Simon, who exclusively works out of the stretch, sets and deals. Runner goes, a square to bunt, pulls it back on a pitch call for a strike. The throw from Seegers into center field. Goes over the head of the second baseman, Heft. Advancing second to third on a throwing error is John John Baring, following his 11th steal in 12 tries on the year. Bearing in at third, Brigman took a called strike. Going back to the previous play, I think we see some of the maturation of the freshman Dittmar at third base, although that ball was cleanly fielded. He wasn't going to make a throw errantly wide of the base and uh, promptly ate that one as that ball was fouled back to the, the fencing. But then you see the speed of John John Bearing. He's got some wheels going and he was motoring to second he would have been in regardless of a good throw or not air allows him to go to third this one swung on and blasted but pulled foul and out of play down the left field side by Brigman Brigman batting second and playing defensively in center field Michael O'Hara the number three batter the right fielder one of just two left-handed batters in the lineup for seventh year head coach Rusty Filter the count, no balls and two strikes as Simon rocks and deals. Uh, swinging a foul ball straight back, keeps Brigman alive. Broncos only were able to advance one runner last night to third base, stranding him. Had multiple runners on second, but Cates and Gonzalez were able to work out of jams early and late. 
Count remains nothing and two as Simon fires. This pitch swung on and lined to left, charging his Panaro. It bounces in front of him for a base hit, and Baring scoring easily. A 90-foot advancement on the Brigman RBI single. His 20th hit of the year gives him RBI number 14. It gives Santa Clara their first run of the day. They lead it once to nothing. It's their first run of this brief two-game weekend series after a rainout. Panaro not getting a very good jump on that one. It was one of those tweeners where wanted to make the jump on that ball, but doesn't want to make any mistakes early in the game. Eats it, keeps the runner at first. Michael O'Hara in from the left. He squares to bunt, gets one down in front of home plate. Seeger the catcher, out to grab it. Throw to first is high, but Krizik with a foot on the bag, snags it. Score that one, sacrifice two to three. Advancing from first to second is Brigman. So one out and a runner in scoring position here in the top of the first for Santa Clara. Sam Simon working with a three-pitch mix, fastball, slider, and changeup, sitting about 87 to 89 on the heater so far. Every now and then, he can creep up into the low 90s as he's improved his lower half mechanics over the last couple of years. Big swing and a miss from Efren Manzero, or Manzo, beg your pardon, the third baseman who hacked at a slider. Simon pitching backwards and gets ahead, no balls, one strike. We're not going to see Simon pitch at the same pace we saw last night with Cates and Gonzalez working and Manzo. Real fast. It's one to center field. Charles back a couple of steps. Center fielder's got it. Tagging a third. Not able to advance his Brigman. Strong throw from Ryland. Charles straight to the bag at third. Keeps Brigman in scoring position at second. Manzo skies out to center for route number two here in the first. Big out from Sam Simon right there. Trying to limit the damage. One of these things that we've looked back over early in the season is when Santa Clara's been able to get a lead. They've been able to keep them. They're not as good as coming from behind, but right now with only a one run lead, Rebels are in striking distance in the bottom of the first. The catcher, Ben Steck, takes a change up high and tight. Right on right matchup, moves one to no. Steck, a 268 hitter on the year. Pair of home runs to go along with 12 RBIs. He lifts this one deep to left field. Underneath it is Santino Panaro. He settles underneath and makes the catch with one hand off the right shoulder for out number three. Overall, in the top of the first inning for Santa Clara, one run on two hits, one error, and one runner left on. UNLV bats against Cade Pilchard in the bottom of the first coming up. Santa Clara leads UNLV one to nothing. Bottom of the first upcoming between UNLV and Santa Clara. The Broncos on the board thanks to an RBI base hit from Coleman Brigman in the top of the first inning. UNLV squaring off against the six foot four, 215 pound red shirt senior, Cade Pilchard. Here this afternoon, Pilchard one and one with a 529 earned run average in 17 innings this year, over four outings, 14 strikeouts, nine walks, a 273 batting average against Pilchard has allowed three home runs out of the 18 hits that he has surrendered on the year. Leading off, Ryland Charles, the center fielder, J.P. Heft, the second baseman, batting second. Isaac Rodriguez makes his seventh start, 12th overall outing of the year, batting third and doing the designated hitting this afternoon with Kate Higgins hitting cleanup and right. Austin Krizik, the first baseman, bats in his customary five spot with the third baseman, Chase Dittmar, hitting sixth. Santino Panaro, number seven in the lineup, number seven on the card as well out in left field. With the catcher, Bailey Seeger hitting eighth, and Paul Myro the fourth at shortstop, rounding out the lineup for Stan Stolte. Ryland Charles to lead things off against Pilchard. Ryland a 267 batting average on the year, 0 for 3 with an RBI and a walk in yesterday's 5 to nothing win. He squares to butt on the first pitch, 
and rolls it foul on the first base side. It bounced inside the left-hand batter's box for strike one. It's kind of a repeat of what Ryland did last night. Saw the infield playing at depth that uh, he thought he could beat him out, and Higgy gives him the green light to do that at any time he wants. Tries to walk the dog multiple times throughout the year that we've watched, which is pretty uh, impressive piece of hitting for Ryland. Pilchard out of the full line, gives up a ground ball, pulled down the first base side, picked up by Dylan Joyce, and the first baseman takes one step to the left, all in motion to retire Charles, three unassisted for out number one. Hard hit ball, better play by Joyce, right place, right time. Yeah, watching Ryland the last few, day, few days, looks a little off balance where his weight seems to be a little farther back than we're used to seeing. Really good at shifting those hips forward and hands following, but seems to be struggling with that at this point. J.P. Heff batting with one out, nobody on. First pitch from Pilcher right down the chute. Fastball called for strike one. J.P. Heft in his first year with the Scarlet and Gray. 368, the batting average. He has been phenomenal hitting near the top of the lineup every game. He's got a home run to go along with 13 runs batted in. Heft also with six doubles among his 25 hits. Takes a bouncing fastball from Pilcher, and the count goes one and one. Defense around Pilchard. We know Dylan Joyce is at first. He retired Charles on that hot shot grounder. Ben Cleary at second. Malcolm Williams, the shortstop double play partner. Efren Manzo at third. The outfield left to right for Santa Clara. Jordan Lewis, Coleman Brigman, and Michael O'Hara. Ben Steck doing the catching, filling up the battery. F last night. Super heads up play after he drove in a run on a single. You notice that pitcher and second baseman were not paying attention. Was able to advance on a stolen base on the pitcher, and then an overthrow gets him to third. Half lines one into the shallow right field. That'll drop for a base hit. First or right fielder Michael O'Hara over into the corner to pick it up. A strong throw on one bounce to second. Limits J.P. Heft to his 26th hit of the year here in the 19th game for UNLV. Heft on with the base hit. It's his third of the series already. He is three of five between last night and today. We're going to have to go back and look at some statistics on his hitting, but I'm going to bet that over 50% of his, his Hits are to the opposite field. Does a really good job keeping those hands in. That one 95 miles an hour off the bat as well. He stung it the other way. Isaac Rodriguez stands in and takes a bouncing ball. Wild pitch advancing Heft up to second base. Heft with a good turn as Ben Steck goes back to the backstop to retrieve it. And now the Rebels with a runner in scoring position with one out. And this is the guy you want up. Rodriguez hot hitting as of late. A 344 batting average on the year. Yeah, he just found his way into the lineup. He's a utility guy we've talked about. Found his home last this weekend, at least, at the DH spot. So it just gives Coach Stolte a lot of opportunities and options with a young guy like him. Pilchard snaps off a slider, breaks over the outside for a called strike one. The count, one ball, one strike with one out and one on for number one, Isaac Rodriguez. Rodriguez yesterday, one for four, did strike out twice, but... So did just about everybody else. The game featured 25 total strikeouts. It was a nice one hour and 55 minute total game time. Which is interesting. Normally when a game features a ton of strikeouts, you'll see a lot of pitches, mm -hmm. extended game time. But no, it was, it was quick. A lot of one, two, three uh, at bats. Count two and one to Rodriguez as Heft leads off second. Second baseman Cleary backs away as Pilcher deals a fastball. Clipping the outer third in the low 90s for a called strike two. I think we talked about it on the broadcast last night. Started for the Rebels. Cates only went full count on one batter the entire game. Just six innings. Well, any game with Austin Cates will feature a, a low game time. Works at that breakneck pace. A la Mark Burley in his prime. The 2-2 two -two in the dirt. A good block by Steck to keep the runner at bay. And the count full was full at 3-2. and two. So Rodriguez down to first base with a walk. His first of the weekend. And now with two on and one down, here comes a pretty good RBI man in Cade Higgins. He's got eight of them on the year. Oh, Rusty, Rusty Filter Rusty. arguing. Yeah. So the scoreboard, and at least in my memory, that it was a 2-2 count. Rusty Filter is coming down with the, the three held up. He thought that that was ball three. Looks like it's an argument he's not going to win, though. I actually think he's right on that one. I, I tend to agree, actually. But Rodriguez, he absolutely sold that. <laughs> he threw the bat and... <laughs> Trot it on down. I mean, I know the Oscars were last week, but we may have to give one uh, retroactively to, <laughs> to Isaac Rodriguez after working his fifth walk of the campaign. One way or another, he worked his way down to first and sets up Kate Higgins with two on. 
First pitch from Pilcher, a slider in the dirt. Call for ball one. Pilcher featuring a fastball, a changeup, and a slider so far. That heater up to 93. He is a big body at six foot four, uses it well. Second pitch to Higgins, way inside. The catcher Steck sliding to the right on the knees to keep it in front. And now Higgy in a great hitter's count with runners on base. He is, but uh, he's been struggling the last couple games also, a la Ryland Charles, both lefties. Rolled over on a few last night that's really we're not used to seeing from Higgy. So looking to stay a little balanced and drive something here with the pitter, uh, batter's count. He watches a 2-0 fastball off the outside. Call for strike one. That is... A hitter's pitch, but Higgins watching all the way. This is a situation right here with a contact hitter like Higgy at this count with one out. We've seen Coach Higgins put something into motion for the Rebels, so we'll see what they got. Wind blowing in, infield double play depth. Here's the 2-1 to Kate Higgins. A swing and a miss. Fastball pushed by him by Pilchard. And the count now even at two. And then immediately the catcher, Ben Steck, calls time, heads out. Usually this uh, occurs when there's a cross-up in the signs. Yeah, and it's, you know, we talked about technology. Really hard to get mixed up between a pitcher and a catcher these days because they're both getting the same signal. So somebody was off on that one. Let's hope they're on the same page. I mean, it becomes a player safety issue at some point. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> You're expecting a curveball low. You wear a fastball off the mask. That uh, will make any catcher unhappy. Count even at two as Higgins stares down Pilcher. Big righty rocks and fires. Change up dropping outside for ball three. And now the count full. Higgins will be sitting on fastball here. Pilcher's done a good job at that rate you were talking about. Right at 93. This is what Higgins going to be sitting on. The 3-2 payoff pitch. Here it is. Higgins swings and fouls a pitch back. That looked like the breaking ball. That was ball. a breaking ball. Yeah. Higgins just able to foul it off and stay alive at three and two. Pilchard's, he's a veteran though. He's going to come in and he's a starter for the Broncos on the weekends. And he's, this isn't just a non-conference game. This is a regular rotation for them. We'll try that one again. Here's the payoff pitch to Higgins. Slider down or call for strike three. Late call by Joseph Penna. Higgins had already turned. He must have said, hey, that's yeah, he a strike. Yep. <laughs> and then signaled it as Higgins frozen by Pilchard for out number one. Or, beg your pardon, out number two. First strike out either way. Comes for the second out of the bottom of the first and brings up Austin Krizik with two on and two down. If you got a guy up with two outs here in the bottom of the first looking for the first runs for the Rebels, this is the guy to have at the plate. Krizik, 23 RBIs, leads all Mountain West batters to this point. Takes a first pitch, fastball upstairs. Call for ball one. Krizik putting up numbers that we're more used to, Dan. 377 batting average, four homers, four doubles, 23 RBIs. In a down year last year by his standards, but back to the numbers that he expects. This is absolutely what we expected from him throughout his career. He takes a slider in the dirt. The catcher stuck down to the knees to stop it. So for the second straight batter with two runners on, Pilchard falls behind two balls, no strikes. See if Krizik can take advantage of the hitter's count here. Chase Dittmar waiting on deck. Isaac Rodriguez on first. He walked to get there. J.P. Heft singled ahead of him. He's off second. On 2-0, and oh, Pilcher throws a beautiful front door slider in there for a called strike one. That's a very confident pitch by the Bronco pitcher. I like his confidence up there. Got that big body you talked about. Relies on that fastball, but that slider is really working for him. He's set. Here's the 2 1 offering to Austin Krizik. In the dirt. Another stab by the catcher, Steck, to keep it in front. And now we're in the other hitter's count that you hear about. Two, yeah. Krizik was 2 0, now he's 3 1. Pilcher threw, overthrew that one a little bit. I think he was trying to get that fastball, which we've seen is 92 93 right now. Trying to put a little more behind it and fell off balance. Krizik trying to tie it up at the least. Santa Clara leads it 1 0. There's a breaking ball over the inside for strike two, and the count goes full. That's he the same pitch that Higgy watched for a called third strike. So nice pitch by the Bronco pitcher at this point. See what he comes back with here at three and two. Both Heft and Rodriguez will be in motion with the pitch as Pilchard sets. Big right-hander rocks and delivers. The runners go. Krizik swings and lines one the other way. Back is O'Hara, right fielder, camped underneath it, makes a catch at the chest for out number three. The Rebels threaten 
but are unable to capitalize in the bottom of the first in the inning. No runs on one hit, no errors, and two runners left on through one inning of play. It's Santa Clara 1, UNLV nothing. Hustlin' Rebel Baseball is brought to you by Parkway Tavern, official partner of UNLV Athletics and your home of Rebels on the Road. With over 250 beers, 24-7 gaming, and seven Valley locations, there's no better place to catch the game than Parkway Tavern. Along with Dan Dolby, Matt Never with you from Earl E. Wilson Stadium. Through an inning of play, Santa Clara Broncos out of the WCC lead the Hustlin' Rebels 1-0. Six, seven, and eight batters in the visiting Bronco lineup to lead it off against Sam Simon, who gave up two hits and had a throwing error by catcher Bailey Seeger, advance a runner in that top half of the first inning. His first pitch of the second, and there for a strike to Dylan Joyce, right-handed batting first baseman. Shortstop Malcolm Williams to follow. Jordan Lewis, the left fielder, in the hole to begin inning number two. Simon on 0-1-1, misses outside with the slider. Rebels put a couple of base runners on with one out in the bottom of the first, but we're unable to move them over, let alone in. Broncos were the ones that generated the runs this inning. That, uh, as that ball is called strike. Last night, that's what the Rebels did. They generated runs other than the home run by Krizik. They were just able to move runners along and score runs in bunches late in the game as that ball misses again outside. That's what the Broncos look like they're looking to do tonight. Get that leadoff runner in. in what was it, Bearing? Yeah, John John Baring. John John Baring, and he was able to motor around. That's a guy you got to keep off the base path. Simon misses outside with another slider, and the count goes full at three and two to Joyce. Big body first baseman hitting 323. No home runs yet to go along with seven RBIs. The 3 2 fouled off. A dribbler down the first base side extends the at bat. Sam Simon's gone to the full count now on three batters. We talked about. The difference last night with Austin Cates only going six innings with the three full uh, full count. Sammy's got a battle here. The three two fouled off again. This one straight back from Joyce. You know, Sammy's got three pitches he really relies on. Right now, fastball is 87 to 89, slider right around 79. That changeup could be a really lethal pitch for him at 81. Another three two off the outside on the slider, called for ball four. Sam Simon issues his 10th walk of the year, and it's the second straight inning that Santa Clara has put a leadoff runner on. They lead it one to nothing. Here's Malcolm Williams, right-handed batting shortstop, wearing number eight, 6'2", 175-pound junior out of Oregon. I'm talking to Coach Vanderhoek this morning. Now that he's got a look at his full lineup in the pitching bullpen as his starters, he's really going to start narrowing things down now. Simon gets ahead of Williams, a called strike high in the zone. As they get into conference play, he'll be going from kind of an 11-guy rotation now down to probably seven this is what he's talking about. Pitch down and away to Williams. Yeah, he's not the only uh, pitching coach in the country doing that. You definitely start to see that once you get into, you know, this part of the year. You get about mm -hmm. 20 games into your schedule. Well, you want to get some of those young guys some early innings too. Line drive shot through the right side of the infield by Williams for a base hit. Joyce advancing up 90 feet as Higgins fires it into the cutoff man. Third hit allowed by Sam Simon is his fourth base runner. Surrendered overall. Williams, it was a 271 hitter coming in. 
lined it right between Krizik and Heft, nearly took out Joyce, who had faked a steal, stopped, and then had to shimmy out of the way as that pitch came right towards his hip. It was a good piece of hitting by Williams. Took a pitch that was inside and able to keep those hands in tight. Just fist that thing through the four hole. Um, Broncos got things rolling again here in the top of the second. Jordan Lewis squares to bunt, drops one down the third base side. Here's the pitcher, Simon. The throw is to third, and it's in time. Chase Dittmar standing on the bag, stretching like a first baseman. Dylan Joyce retired huge to get the lead runner in that sacrifice situation. Yeah, you had to have to have some coaching with Joyce there. He made a good break, but traditionally, you're going to see a pitcher go to first to get the sure out. Sam Simon spun and got that, and it looked like Joyce with no slide, kind of came in a little slower than I'm sure that their coaching staff would have wanted, but big out right there for Sam Simon. Fielder's choice, no sacrifice for Lewis, as Ben Cleary, the number nine batter, takes ball one outside. Runners on first and second now with one out. Santa Clara leads it one to nothing. Cleary, the second baseman at the bottom, hitting 214, looking to get it going offensively. Simon looking for a ground ball double play. You know, you see that. A lot of times on that sacrifice month where a runner will break from second to third, pretty confident it's the ball's going to be thrown to first, so he makes that, that round to third in case something gets away. He can score right there. He's just got to get into the bag, and he's got to slide to get there. Definitely takes away some efficiency from the route when you bend it around like that. Simon turns and throws to second base. Back in standing and safely is Williams. Second baseman J.P. Heft keeping an eye on him over there. No hole behind on the runner. At first is Krizik off the bag, just behind the baseline. Deep in the hole, it's short as Myro. Dittmar creeps towards the base at third. Slider, high and tight, nearly clips the jersey of Cleary, but he's able to get out of the way. Cleary, six feet, 195 pounds. One of four freshmen in the lineup tonight. There were six freshmen in the lineup yesterday for Rusty Filter. Fastball over the heart of the plate on 3-0 and as Simon steals a strike. On Cleary, the leadoff man, John John Baring on deck. This is a opportunity for Simon to get something rolled over here. You don't want to see Baring coming up with bases loaded and that speed. Runner breaks for third. The throw is to second and sliding in head first and safely on a stolen pace is Malcolm Williams. He just was too quick in that first step. A little bit too early. It was a good move by Simon. He heard it, but a great closing speed by Williams. Oh, absolutely. You got a great break right there. Still, with runners on first and one out, still the double play is still in play here. Trying to get him something on something to roll over here. Three one count. Runner breaks for second. The pitch is high for ball four. So Lewis advances up to second as Cleary walks. That'll load the bases with one out here in the top of the second inning. It'll wrap the lineup back to the top as John John Baring set to bat. It'll also bring out the pitching coach, Corey Vanderhoek. He's coming out to talk strategy and try to get Simon to work down a bit. He has been missing up and away to basically just about all these right-handed batters. He has, and this is textbook Bronco baseball right now. They are going to run the bases. This lineup, these nine starters today have 32 attempted base steals. So this is going to be aggressiveness from the Broncos but right now, just to your point, Sam Simon's just got to focus on what he's doing. He's been up in the zone. Both of the hits that he's given up this inning have been up. Pitches that were up and away and were taken to the opposite field. So good opportunity for Coach Vanderhoek to get out there, calm his young man down. Sam's been solid for him throughout this early in this part of the year. It's an opportunity for him to battle back. Sam Simon, in his four previous starts, has not gone shorter then five and two-thirds innings. Back-to-back -back outings of seven, seven. shutout <laughs> against Pacific and Bradley. He's got five and two-thirds in both of his conference appearances against San Jose State on the third and a week later against New Mexico in Albuquerque on the 10th. Bases loaded, one down for John John Barry. He swings, hammers this one to right center field. Wind caught it as the second baseman, Rodriguez, or Heft comes out. Higgins comes in. Runner tags up from third. And a high arcing fly ball will be just that. An out for Baring. That's a big one for out number two. Great communication by Higgy and Heft out there. The ball was a, probably in the range that Heft could have gotten to it. But with Higgy on the run like that, moving forward and having that momentum, I'm going to be able to make a great play at the plate. Broncos have to hold. Thought he was able to hit it a little bit harder, but at five foot seven, 175, Baring 
much more of a speedster than a true power batter. Coleman Brigman batting with the bases loaded and two down, and Simon gets ahead with a called strike one. And yeah, that's going to be key for him going forward. We've talked about the Rebel pitching getting ahead of batters this season. Sam Simon's got to settle in and do the same. Out of the stretch, he gives up a foul ball, chopped down the third base side off the netting in front of the visiting Santa Clara dugout. Simon's ahead, nothing and two. This is the opportunity to throw a waste pitch, but nothing that's going to get away from Seeger behind the plate. Williams off third, Lewis off second. Ben Cleary, who walked, leads off first. Infield deep with two down and a one nothing game. 0-2 pitch, pulled foul very sharply this time. Simon went right after him on 0-2. Simon got away with one right there. It was a high and inside fastball that Brigman saw coming. He had the RBI base hit to left field in the first. He's pulled everything this at bat as well. Here's another 0-2. Bounced down and inside. It's not far enough away from Seeger for an advancement, though. Had to play at second, but Seeger, I, I think, smartly puts it in the back pocket. It, yeah. You know, we talked about a waste pitch. That's a good waste pitch right there, although that bounced about four feet in front of the plate. But great stop by Seeger as that ball bounced up. He had to find it. Came back into field of play. No runner to be able to advance on that. The one two, roll down the third base side, grabbed by Dittmar, who thought about a tag, instead sets the feet, fires across the first. Good footwork by Krizik, moving into foul ground with the foot on the base to retire it in the side. Rebels strand the bases loaded against Santa Clara in the top of the second. Overall, in the frame for the visiting Broncos. No runs on one hit, no errors, and three runners left on base. Bottom of the second coming up, the Rebels looking to avenge a one to nothing deficit. Chase Dittmar to lead things off in the home half of the second inning. Rebels looking to complete a two-game sweep of the visiting Santa Clara Broncos. They trail it one to nothing. Dittmar stands in against Cade Pilcher, who deals his 24th pitch of the afternoon. It misses high off the glove of the catcher's stack for ball one. Dittmar followed by Panaro and Seeger to lead things off here in the second inning. Rebels able to strand the bases loaded in the top of the second. Santa Clara had four separate base runners on, but three outs in quick succession. Retired the side as Dittmar backs away from a high and inside fastball. Pilcher's been throwing hard today in the low 90s all the way up to 93, but he missed up and in there to go 2-0 on Dittmar. A 3-33 batter in his second year on the club. Slightly closed off stance on the right side as he swings and misses at a chest-high heater. Actually, he's going to take a red shirt last year because he didn't play in enough qualifying games. So Rebels have him for four more, three more years after this, four years total. Graduate of... Basic Academy in Henderson, one of the best programs on the West Coast. He rolls this one over on the ground, a chopper to the third base side. Off the mound is Pilchard. Pilchard sets the feet and throws to first. PFP's important. Pitcher fielding practice and Pilchard showing it there. He's retired both leadoff hitters, and that'll bring up Panaro with nobody on, one out here in the second. Pilchard's done a good job of keeping the Rebels off balance. He's really working the plate, changing up his pitches, but that Slider seems to be really working for him at this point. You always wonder about the bigger guys on the mound as mm -hmm. far as getting off the hill and making plays defensively. Pilchard, no sweat on that one. That was very athletic. 
So Santino Panaro tries to scratch across a run as he takes a slider elevated above the chest for ball one. A lot of times, too, you worry about a big guy like that having to get down and get that ball off the shoelaces and spin and turn, but he took his time and made a good, strong throw. Pilcher, the red shirt senior, fifth year player for Rusty Filter. He deals high. Count goes 2 0 to Panaro, batting 286 on the year. He was in left field last night. Was 0 for 3, but took a walk and scored one of the five runs for UNLV in a 5 0 win. Rebels blanking the Broncos, out hitting them as well, 7 5. On 2 0, Pilcher deals out of the full line. And Panaro takes a fastball, framed up nicely by the catcher's stick. That is a prime example of pitch framing on the outside. Absolutely. That ball was off the plate by an inch or two. But a good job by the catcher. To your point, those, those framers, those are, that's, a, that's an art. The 2-1. Swung on and lined on the left field side, but it's foul by about 10 feet. Yeah, pitch framing. Something that is likely to be eliminated from the game in the coming years with the uh, with the ABS automatic ball strike system introduced in the minor leagues eventually going to work its way up to the big leagues in some capacity. Yeah, once that robot comes in, it's not going to care where you frame that thing. It's going to be where it came across the plate. Somewhere Gary Sanchez is <laughs> very happy about that. On two and two, Pilcher delivers. Panaro lifts a foul ball straight back. That was a slider down in on the shoot tops. Good job to go down and get it by Santino. Well, you see some catchers that... You know, balls are six to eight inches out of the zone, and they're still trying to frame them, which can, to me is kind of a waste of time because you're not going to fool an umpire that bad. That last pitch, by the way, getting the track man data, three and a half inches off. It was framed back for a strike. Spinaro waves and misses at a fastball high and away for strike three. No shot there. Pilcher blowing it by him. He's recorded a couple of strikeouts, and he's got two outs here in the second. It'll be Bailey Seeger looking to jumpstart some offense out of the eight spot. Kate Pilcher coming off of a six-inning shutout win against UC Davis. Broncos defeated the Aggies 7-0 one week ago today. Pilcher gave up one hit but walked four batters while also striking out four, tying his season high. He struck out two today, falls behind Seager 1-0. The Rebels started off slow last night, were hitless through four, but with two outs, Austin Krizik was able to take one to the opposite field. One hit, one run. Open stance for Seager. Out of Highlands Ranch, Colorado, about a half hour south of Denver. It's a ground ball up the middle. Charging is the shortstop, Williams. Got to be quick to first, and he is. Great transfer and throw off the back foot from the shortstop, Williams. Rebels down in order. Ground out, strike out, ground out. With three outs in quick succession. And through two innings, it's Santa Clara on top of UNLV, one to nothing. Top of the third, one to nothing. Santa Clara on top of UNLV. Broncos with the heart of their lineup due up as the three, four, five hitters lead things off against Sam Simon. 37 pitches through two innings for the Las Vegas born right-hander. And he misses down and away on a changeup to Michael O'Hara. 
right left-handed batting right fielder who sacrificed a runner over on a bunt a run that eventually ended up scoring in the first he takes another pitch low and inside from sam simon two and oh the count efren manzo and ben steck on deck and in the hole respectively here in the third inning simon who only works from the stretch deals and gets a called strike over the outside and moves the count two and one rebels down in order in the second so far so good for cade pilchard giving up one hit one walk two strikeouts through two innings on the hill for santa clara line drive base hit to right center field as o'hara able to slap that one over the head of the second baseman heft for his 14th hit of the year leads the inning off with a hit all three leadoff hitters have now reached for santa clara a defensive substitution in the top of the third chase ditmar who had rolled over on a ground ball back to the mound to lead off his second pulled from the game brendan o'sullivan takes over for him on the left side of the infield at third base o'sullivan for ditmar for those scoring along at home efren manzo who flying out to center field in the first inning stands in looks at a throw to first and they got him simon picks off o'hara We've seen Sam Simon execute a couple of successful pickoff moves this year. He is so quick, that jump move from the right-hander, deadly. Yeah, that snap move, he got that ball right over there, and that ball that was thrown right at the bag. So uh, Krizik was able to just field that ball, and the runner was able to just slide right into it. So he wipes out the leadoff base hit. This is Haida Manzo to start the at-bat. That's one where Krizik lets the runner tag himself out. You just don't even have to move the glove. You just leave it on the base. And Manzo, the top power batter for Santa Clara, who's behind, or ahead, rather, two balls, no strikes. I think that was a real critical out for Simon at this point. Came into this inning with 37 pitches. Now, remember, he's going to be on a day short uh, rest next weekend because he got pushed back from Saturday to Sunday. So he'll be the Saturday starter next week in Reno, working on one day less rest. Here's his 2-1 offering. Manzo lines one to center field. It falls in front of Ryland Charles, who picks it up on one hop. So after the leadoff runner picked off, Manzo replaces him right away with a very similar-looking hit. One out, one on, as Ben Steck stands in. Simon looking for a ground ball, although those have been hard to come by so far today for Sammy. Yeah, absolutely. And the reason I bring that point up is because last night, Cates was on a pitch count right around 80 to 85 so I would imagine coach Vanderhoek is probably going to be the same as Bronco coach has a conversation with a third base, um base umpire I'm not sure what that's about yeah Rusty Filter went out there and had a couple of words with Brooks O'Hearn behind third base and heads back to the dugout now yeah really not sure what that was regarding for his pitch from Simon a breaking ball that looked like the curveball down and away to Steck I mean, he hasn't opened up with too many curveballs, so he's trying to find something right now, get some rhythm going. He hasn't really thrown a ton of curveballs either. Mm -hmm. He uh, added that pitch in the offseason and is mixing it in there every now and then. This one swung on, hit in the air, deep to right center field. Higgins dropping back, right fielder in front of the warning track, loves it in front of the chest. Efren Manzo was right now, right near second base, rather, and has to head back to the base at first on a fly out to right from Steck. He's over two with a pair of pop outs. Two outs, one on, one to nothing. Santa Clara leads in the third. As Dylan Joyce, the first baseman, looks to extend the frame. Dylan Joyce, big presence in the box there. Yeah, all of six foot four, 245 pounds. Graduate student who also pitches some. Swings to the first pitch and lines it foul and out of play beyond the right field side. Very traditional stance from the right side of the plate there. Hands held high, big guy like that. Looking to pop those hips a little, get those hands through. He's a power guy. Off of first is Manzo. One of one and steal opportunities on the year. With that in mind, they throw over. He's back in head first and safely. You made the point earlier, Dan, about Santa Clara and how much they like to run. Heading into today, the Broncos were 31 of 37 in stolen base attempts. And just for comparison, the Rebels, who don't run often at all, 7 of 12. Different schools of thought is pitch down low. The throw from catcher Seeger down to first is not in time. Nice little snap throw on the back pick. The runner... Off of first, Manzo had faked to move to second. That's something that we've seen all day so far from the Broncos. Well, one of the reasons the Rebels don't run that much is because a lot of their hits are multi-base hits. So there's no need to be running at that point. You throw over again. Manzo back in safely ahead of it on another head first dive. Yeah, the Rebels with 192 hits on the year. Let's see how quickly we can do this other math. 48 doubles and triples to go along with 16 home runs on the year as Simon Gets a swing and a miss, blowing a fastball by Joyce. I'm not a math guy, but I think that's a pretty good percentage. 
Yeah, 64 out of 192. Not too bad. About, about a third. Just about a third of their hits are from extra bases. That's a great ratio. And something they've done over the last handful of years with a lot of this offensive core returning. Another throw to first. Another time back in safely for Manzo. Manzo's not taking a big lead, so Sammy's trying to keep him tight. Needs to concentrate, get this third out of the inning. So when the pitcher is annoyed, he says, all right, you guys want to steal. <laughs> I'm going to throw over every time. Another throw to first is not in time. It's one of the few rules that college baseball has not adopted that's in the major leagues yet, the, uh, the disengagement limit. Yep. I'd like to see him have that in college, I although do. it would be a huge advantage for the Broncos today. Oh, yeah, teams like that. Uh, foul ball straight back. Keeps the count. One ball, two strikes. Yeah, it helps add to base running and stolen base attempts as well. We saw the numbers skyrocket in Major League Baseball when they instituted the policy last year. Which is opposite of what they've been trying to do on eliminating time in games. Sliders high and away. Two balls and two strikes now the count. Has yeah. created more offense. Has created more runs. But it hasn't lessened the game at all. Yeah, really... The, the, the game time's down. Saw some data last week on it. Really interesting to see what a lot of these new rules have done. This one's blasted. Deep to right field by Joyce. Higgins on his horse. Right fielder's at the track. At the wall, he leaps. It's off the wall and back in towards the field of play for extra bases. Rounding third. Heading to the plate is Manzo. He'll score without a throw as it's cut off by J.P. Heft. And on an RBI double, his fourth two-bagger of the year, Dylan Joyce drives in another run, his eighth run bad at the end of the campaign and it's now two to nothing Santa Clara in the third yeah we talked about his power that ball was hit right at the base of the top of the fence Higgy as he was trailing over towards center field overran that by a step as that ball was trailing away from him towards the right field line Malcolm Williams stands in takes a called strike one Simon steals a strike on the outside and that thing had a wicked tail on it coming from the right-handed bat towards right field those way more often than not tend to hook towards the corner. And fastball outside. Williams not expanding the strike zone. Well, but, you know, he's on his horse working his way towards center field, and that's a hard one to judge when you're reaching out for the fence also. Simon comes set looking at second. Deals to the plate and misses outside with the overhand breaking ball. Williams in the second, singled. Moving up to second on a fielder's choice. Bunted down by Ben Cleary. Williams then stole third. Was stranded as the bases were left loaded. He swings and skies this one. Deep to left field. Over into the corner is Panaro. Left fielder into foul ground as he watches it bounce over the batting cage. Beyond the visiting bullpen, it's a long, loud strike two to move the count even at Deuces Wild. Yeah, he was turning on that one. He was sitting on something like a fastball, but uh, Simon took a little bit off that. It got out in front of it. Simon. Gets a swing and a miss for strike three. Williams has a fastball blown by him. Our Belfort property restoration strikeout of the game ends the threat in the top of the third inning. An RBI double for Dylan Joyce extends the lead in the top of the third. One run on three hits. No errors and a man left on. Paul Myro to lead things off in the bottom of the third inning for UNLV, who trails this one two to nothing. Nine, one, and two to lead things off in the batting order for UNLV in the bottom of the third. 
trailing Santa Clara 2 to nothing in a weekend non-conference series. A rain-affected non-conference series as well. Friday's game moved to Saturday, eventually canceled. Rebels won 5 to nothing yesterday, finishing it up against the Broncos today. Paul Myro stands in and wears the first pitch from Cade Pilchard. Pilchard plunks him on the arm, and that's a way to get on for Paul Myro, who was hit by a pitch for the fourth time this year. That's not a category you want to lead the team in, but hey, he'll take it any way he can get yeah, it absolutely. on that, Pilchard. That was just a slider by Pilchard that he let get away and didn't break back across the plate. Myro's not moving much on that one. Myro on first for Ryland Charles, who takes a fastball, elevated above the zone for ball number one. Charles grounded out on a hot shot, bouncer to first, in the first to lead off the game. Dylan Joyce holding on at first. Small lead for Myro as Ryland takes ball two down and away. Kate Pilchard pitching in his third year for Santa Clara. He entered the college ranks in 2020. We all know what happened there. He didn't appear in a game that year in the shortened season. Time called, by the way, as Ben Steck goes out and has a word. That's twice now that they may have had their signals mixed up. So we got to get on the same page here. The Rebels making the trip up north to arch rival out of Reno. Be going to the home of Ryland Charles next weekend as he played high school ball at Reno High School. So this will be his last time to go home before, before the home crowd up there and Try to show them what uh, Hustlin' Rebel Baseball is all about. Ryland, one of two Reno natives on the team, along with pitcher Dylan Rogers out of the bullpen. Left-handed batter and thrower at the top of the lineup. Swings and misses at an elevated fastball, climbing the ladder on Pilchard. There was a little anger behind that pitch by Pilchard. Pilchard, who has a 4-1-6 career ERA. Good numbers for the college level. 6-4 and four record career coming in. There's a heater right down Broadway for strike two. Charles now even, two balls and two strikes. Coming back, those two straight fastballs, it gives Pilchard a good opportunity to throw whatever he wants right here against a really good hitter in Ryland Charles. He's choked up on the bat. Pilchard looks to first, deals to the dish. Ryland swings and pops it up, shallow to center field. Sprinting in is Coleman Brigman. Brigman calls off the shortstop, Williams, who gave it a look. And it'll be the center fielder to settle underneath and make the out. Charles now 0 for 2. Back to first is Ryland Charles. Here's J.P. Heft, who singled and was stranded in the first inning. That hit, by the way, the only hit so far for UNLV. That's one area where Pilchard has always had success. Opponents batting average against. This year, coming into the game, a 273 number. Pretty good. Nothing to scoff at. The worst of his career by almost 70 points. Throw to first. Sends Myro diving back in head first and safely. For Pilchard in his first year in 2022, a 202 batting average against. He was even better than that last year, 194 over 54 innings. He's got a 211 career batting average against coming into this game. Another throw to first, another slide for Myro, who has not attempted a stolen base yet this year. Yeah, I don't think Paul is much of a threat right at this point in the game. Mostly to keep him tight, anything into the gap would try to hold him at second. One out, one on in a 3 nothing game. Pilchard fires a slider in through the front door for a called strike. He's thrown that pitch with confidence to righties all day. That's a fantastic pitch by the young man right there. Starts in on the hands at the belt. Works back across the plate. Probably got about six to eight inch break on that. Left fielder Lewis away from the line. If Heft is able to hook one into the corner. Instead, he takes high on the slider. Count goes even at a ball and a strike. And Pilchard has always kind of pitched in a hybrid role in his three years at Santa Clara. Two years ago, 15 outings, four starts. Last year, 16 appearances, five starts, along with a pair of saves to go with his 4-1 and record and 3-4-8 ERA in 2023. The 1-1 lined at a plate on the right field side, and with the runner in motion, a pretty obvious hit and run, just unable to put it in fair territory, was Heft. What a good job with by Heft right there, just getting... It's bat extended to keep that, that bat alive right now. Myro had a pretty good jump. See if anything is reworked from a hit and run standpoint here. On one and two, Myro does not go. The pitch is in the dirt. It gets away from the catcher down the third base side, but Myro not able to advance. That's one of those where if you don't make that snap split-second decision, it's already too late. Myro 
with the conservative approach, it's back to first. Yeah, one of the keys to that, though, is to stay low in your stance. He actually came straight up as he was trying to find that ball and bounce on his toes. You got to, to your point, you got to make that decision early and commit to that. 2-2 two -two count in a 2 nothing game here with one out in the third. Pilcher deals. Swung on, hit in the air to left field. Heading back is Lewis. Left fielder underneath it, stops, heads back in towards the infield and gloves it for the out. Heading back to first is Myro. After the first pitch of the inning, hit the leadoff batter in Myro. Back-to-back flyouts have him still on first base with two down as Isaac Rodriguez tries to extend the frame. He walked back in the first. To this point, the only base on balls issued by Pilcher. It'll be interesting to see what Coach Higgins' approach is as the game works into the deeper innings as Pilcher's throwing a gem. He's trying to generate some runs. You may see a little bit more small ball. First pitch high. The throw down from the catcher. Not in time to first base. Still in Joyce. There to apply the tag, but Myro just able to get back after a big secondary lead. A good snap throw from Steck right there. If that ball's more towards the inside part of the bag, that's going to be a lot closer. Steck was his momentum moving that way on that high fastball. He had to pop out of the stance. Another high fastball. This one up and inside for ball two. Rodriguez in a good hitter's count against a guy who has not given up a lot of hits. His last two starts against Washington and UC Davis. Pilchard, 11 innings, one earned run on just four hits and eight strikeouts. Pretty impressive. Great numbers to this point. He deals on 2-0. and oh. Inside, Rodriguez leans away. And with Kate Higgins on deck and two outs, the count three balls and no strikes to the Rebels' right-handed batting designated hitter. You would got to imagine at this point that bat's going to stay on the shoulder. Holding on at first is Joyce. Pilchard on 3-0 and oh, deals to the dish. Fastball right down Broadway for strike one. To your point, Dan, no inclination to swing there for Irod as he takes the fastball right down the chute. They're going to make Pilcher try to stretch it out. He had thrown 35 pitches through two innings, 23 of them in the first. On three and one, he comes set and fires. Rodriguez backs away from ball four, high and tight. Second walk of the game, second time that Rodriguez has taken a call ball four. And with Myro advancing to second and Rodriguez on first, tying run on, go ahead run of the plate in the form of Cade Higgins. And here comes a visit from assistant coach John Karchich. This is just going to be a little conversation as there's a little commotion going out down in the Bronco bullpen, but nobody even throwing, just some stretching going on at this point. Probably a strategy against the left-handed hitter, Higgy. You don't want to give it one stroke of the bat against Higgy and be down one in this ball game. So they're going to, I think, be pretty selective with the way that they approach Higgins. Yeah, typically when the pitching coach calls the entire infield in, there's a strategic element as far as the ball in play. Although with two outs and a force play active anywhere around the infield, you would assume that the infielder is going to go whatever way the ball takes them. See a you know, ground ball inside the bag at third, for instance, fielded by Manzo. He would just take that step to the right and touch it up. So here we go. Now visit ends. First of seven used up by Santa Clara's. Myro in scoring position on second. Rodriguez off first. Here's Kate Higgins, who took a call, strike three, in the hot bottom half of the first inning. Right on left matchup here in the third. As Higgins swings to the first pitch, lines it to the gap in left center. That's down for a base hit. Rounding third. Here comes Myro to the plate. A low throw bounce to the cutoff man, and that'll give Kate Higgins an RBI base hit. His ninth ribby of the year has the Rebels on the board, and all of a sudden, the tying run at scoring position with two outs, a great piece of hitting early, early in the at-bat by Higgy. Yeah, I love the aggressiveness, and not unexpected, as Higgy's worked deep into the count earlier today and a couple times last night. So... You give the pitcher the advantage. He's just coming out there swinging right now, and I love that aggressiveness. Brings up Austin Krizik, who is the prime time RBI man in this lineup as he takes a front door slider for a strike. Just another example of Pilcher trusting that slider to righties. Both center and right playing relatively shallow against Krizik. Krizik swings and fouls a pitch off. That pitch down by the shoe tops. That's his sweet spot, but he misses. Rather, can't get all of it. And the count goes nothing in two. Krizik flying out to right field to wrap up the first inning. Rebels stranded a pair of runners on in that frame. They'll try to avoid the same fate here in the third with two on and two down. Here's the 0-2 from Pilcher. 
down and away. Good watch by Chris. That's a good pitch by Pilchard right there. Keeping that ball low and away. So Chris can't get his hands extended through the zone right there because he's looking for something to drive. Standing tall and close to the plate from the right-hand batter's box. Here's the one-two from Kate Pilchard. Swung on, ripped, but pulled foul into the visiting bullpen. Look out down there, relief court. Chris was sitting on the fastball right there. Got the hands around it early as he settles back in from the right. Brendan O'Sullivan awaiting on deck for his first plate appearance. He'll hope it's in the third. Here's another one, too. Another ball pulled foul. This one on the ground on the third base side. But a good piece of hitting by Chris. We've talked about his discipline at the plate over the years. It's a great example of this. The ball is off the plate, but he's not going to leave anything to chance. He's going to foul the ball off. We've seen him do this. We've, there was one at bat earlier in the year. We saw seven straight balls that were fouled off, and then he was able to drive one into a gap. He's so good at identifying his pitch. See if we can do it here. Pilcher deals. Krizik lifts it to left center field. Here comes Brigman. Center fielder slides and makes an outstanding catch on the move to retire the side. A web gem ends the threat for the Rebels in what could have been a big time inning, but they do get on the board, courtesy of a Kate Higgins RBI base hit, a run on one hit, no errors, and a pair of runners left on for the Rebels in the third. UNLV on the scoreboard, but trailing by a run after three innings full. It's Santa Clara two, UNLV one. Top of the fourth inning here on St. Patrick's Day at Early Wilson Stadium. Santa Clara leading UNLV 2-1. to one. Rebels on the board in the bottom of the third, sending six hitters to the plate, their longest frame offensively in this one. Jordan Lewis, the left fielder, leads things off against Sam Simon to start the fourth inning. And he takes a fastball high and tight from Sam, who had needed 58 pitches to get through three innings of work, giving up two runs, spreading out the six hits. Lewis swings and fouls a pitch back. Count goes even at one and one. Eight, nine, and one due up in the visiting Santa Clara lineup. Broncos entering into the game 10 and six with one of those losses being a five to nothing defeat right here at Early Wilson Stadium last night. Lewis takes high. He backs away, and the count goes two balls and one strike. UNLV baseball going on, softball going on. Busy day on campus. Going to be a busy week next week for a lot of folks as Williams pulls a ball foul. Exciting time this afternoon. Lady Rebels going to find out where they're going in the big dance. So they won back to back to back Mountain West Conference championships. So they'll find out where they're going today at 530. 2-2 two -two to Lewis. Yanked on the third base side. Fouling out of play on the left field line. Yeah. I was going to say both, uh, both the men's and women's teams. They're going to have an exciting selection Sunday. But for the women, you mentioned their third straight Mountain West title. Although the title game against San Diego State was a lot tighter than they had become accustomed to come tournament time. Well, they had beat San Diego State by 49 points their previous meeting. Aztecs made it a little closer than we wanted. Pitch outside. Count goes full to the leadoff man, Lewis, who reached on a fielder's choice in the second. Men are going to have an opportunity to get some postseason play, so we'll look to see if they can get something in an, for an, from an NIT bid. Lifted into the right center field as Charles heads over into the gap right in front of the retired 13 for former head coach Fred Dallimore. He tracks it down for out number one as one outfielder 
flies out to another. For Sam Simon, that's the first leadoff hitter he's retired now through four innings. Ben Cleary stands in now at the bottom of the lineup with one out, nobody on ahead of him. The Rebels, well, the, the running Rebels on the men's side, also against San Diego State, played a thriller of, of a first-round game last week in the Mountain West Tournament, unable to pull out the win in overtime after beating the Aztecs at the Thomas and Mack Center just a week and a half prior. Yeah, the, not, they didn't end up where they wanted to this year, but they had eight quad one wins this season, so that's going to make them pretty attractive. Hot shot ground ball to the left side, backhanded by Paul Myro from the hole at short. He sets the feet and fires a missile over to Krisic at first for the out. Great play by Myro. We've come to expect that from the Las Vegas native. Yeah, he got that ball deep in the hole at short. That's about a 160-foot rocket over to Chris at first to record the second out of the inning. You know, they, they say that the longest throw in the infield is from third. They're wrong. That yeah, one that, that we saw is it right there. That's on the grass behind short. Yeah, that throw deep in the hole at short as hard as it gets for an infielder, especially coming across the body like that. Myro able to set the feet. First pitch swinging is John John Baring, leadoff man doing the D the DHing today. Uh, fouls it straight back. He's one for two. Single, stole second in the first and scored on a base hit by Brigman. And then flied out to right in the second inning. He takes outside even the count. This would be a dangerous man to have on base, even with two outs, because he's able to generate with his legs. Santa Clara, the defending WCC tournament champions. Baring pops it up, left side of the infield. O'Sullivan behind the base at third and fair ground, makes a two-hand catch at the chest for out number three. And Sam Simon, as efficient as he has been all day, going one, two, three through the top of the fourth. Zeros across for Santa Clara in the fourth. It'll be Brendan O'Sullivan making his first trip to the bat after making the final out of the inning. When we come back, two to one, Santa Clara leads it. Here's Brendan O'Sullivan to lead things off for UNLV in the home half of the fourth, trailing it two to one against Santa Clara. O'Sullivan in for the first time today, came in as a defensive replacement for Chase Dittmar in the top of the third, was on deck when Krizik flied out to end the third. Phenomenal sliding stab by the center fielder Brigman ended the threat. The Rebels were able to get on the board in the inning. You got to get O'Sullivan in the lineup on St. Patty's Day. I think that's why he was inserted when he was. Stan Stolte said, oh, yeah, forgot, <laughs> forgot what day it was because of the leap year. St. Patrick's Day on a Sunday this year. O'Sullivan, though, in his first plate appearance on the day, you know, mostly for his namesake, he's behind nothing and two. A 368 batter on the year, playing for the ninth time. He's made four starts in the lineup so far. Long look from Pilchard as he deals. O'Sullivan swings and misses at strike three. Good morning, good afternoon, and good night. A three-pitch K is O'Sullivan set down on three pitches. Third K for Pilchard. Sets up Santino Panara with one out and nobody on here in the fourth inning. Pilchard impressive for sure. Pitching on Sundays for Santa Clara. This Broncos team that after today's game takes on San Jose State in a non-con on Tuesday. Another Mountain West foe. Panaro, who struck out in the second, takes a call ball one off the inside. They'll open WCC play next weekend, Friday, Saturday, Sunday series 
at home against Portland. The Pilots head to Santa Clara. Called strike one to Panaro, moves the count even at one. Pilchard 58 pitches coming into this inning. He's still at that 92-93 on the fastball, so this young man's a horse. Big body at 6'4", 215 pounds as Panaro pops it up, shallow to left field. Heading back is the shortstop, Williams. In foul ground, he slides and is able to make the catch over the head. Williams battling the wind as it pushed it towards the left field corner. Able to get it while heading to the ground, and Panaro pops out in foul ground to the shortstop for route number two. That's a good play. That's a shortstop ball right there. Comes over, slides down on one knee. The ball does pop out of his heel, but he's able to retain that. The second out of the inning, Rebels looking to get something rolling here. Yeah, that was anything but a clean catch, but a catch nonetheless. For the second out, Bailey Seeger out of the eighth spot. Makes a call, ball one outside from Pilchard. For Sam Simon, through four innings, 70 pitches thrown. He's given up two runs on six hits, although he had his best inning in his most recent one. Top of the fourth was one, two, three. Seeger slaps this one to left field. Coming in is Jordan Lewis. And on the move, he'll make the catch at the eyes for out number three. The Rebels down in order for the second time in four innings, the six, seven, and eight spots, doing it both times. Zeros across for UNLV in the fourth, top of the fifth. Coming up next, Santa Clara holds a two-to-one lead. Sam Simon back out for the fifth as Santa Clara leads UNLV 2-1. to one. Coleman Brigman leading things off as the right-handed batting center fielder stands in one of two, swings to the first pitch and hits it high in the air to center field. Back goes Charles, center fielder in front of the warning track, able to grab it, battling with the sun. One pitch, one out. So far, so good for Sam Simon in the fifth. He's now retired the last five batters he's faced on a grand total of 13 pitches. Yeah, that's a good pitch right there. He's going to pop one up to... Mid-range center field, but one pitch coming in. He's keep that pitch count down. We can get a couple more innings out of Sammy. Easy math. Started the inning at 70. The out after pitch, 71. His 72nd pitch of the afternoon is called for a strike. I might have handled that one. <laughs> right fielder O'Hara had squared to bunt. Pulled it back with nobody on and watched a heater right down Broadway for strike one. Simon comes back and it's strike two on the outside. And Seeger may have stolen that one with a good frame job. That was a good frame, but... We're seeing that the home plate umpire, Joseph Pena, actually extended the zone a little bit. And because of that, O'Hara has to expand the strike zone and pops one foul out of play on the left field side. I was given the report yesterday that Alberto Ruiz had a pretty wide strike zone as well by an home plate. He did, which as long as you're consistent, both teams are going to be happy with exactly, it. Exactly, yeah. The crew chief behind first base today. This one swung on and crushed deep to right field by O'Hara. Back goes Higgins. It's off the base of the wall for extra bases. Higgy picks it up on the warning track. Slamming on the brakes at second is O'Hara. He's in with a double, his third of the year. And with one on and a runner in scoring position. One out, beg your pardon. It's Efren Manzo looking to extend the lead. Good piece of hitting there by O'Hara with two strikes. Yeah, but that's also a mistake that Sam Simon makes. Being ahead in the count 0-2. 
talked about keeping something off the plate. That was right down Broadway. Hare was able to turn on that one. Lucky that didn't get out of here. Off the bat, I thought I'd, it was. It is hard to yank one down into that corner with the high walls and no wind pushing it out today, but O'Hara, who does have a home run on the year, unable to do so. First pitch to Efren Manzo off the outside for his strike. The right-on-right -right matchup starts out 1-0. Simon working with a bit of tempo as he gets a foul ball pushed straight back to even the count. I'm also going to go back to the fact that the play-by-play -play announcer talked about five in a row for <laughs> Sammy Simon. So it could be the jinx. I wish I had that much control. <laughs> Manzo takes another pitch off the outside. Yeah, the, the broadcaster's curse. I, like I said, I, I wish that I could influence the game that much. We'd play a lot quicker games overall if that were the case, right? And the Rebels would probably win. <laughs> They'd be undefeated. Every night. This one's popped up down the right field corner. O'Higgins over to the side. He keeps on moving towards the warning track and watches it bounce off the clubhouse building and back towards the field of play. Foul ball, strike two, evens the count. We talked about... St. Patrick's Day, O'Sullivan, you, act, you could actually use O'Higgins out in O'Charles. Oh, oh, Charles. <laughs> I'm not sure that O'Panaro would work very well. O'Panaro, so yeah. <laughs> you have the Italian blood with the Irish name. That one doesn't work so well. They don't always get along historically. Uh, three and two. Or two, two rather. Fastball down low. Now the count full at three and two to Manzo, who flying out to center. Singled and scored in the third. I think O'Myro the fourth would be another good one. That's a good one. 3-2 pitch, grounded through the left side of the infield, past Brendan O'Sullivan and into left. Getting the wave around third is O'Hara. The throw from Panaro goes to second base, and O'Hara able to score on an Efren Manzo RBI base hit. His second hit of the game gives him his team leading 23rd run batted in, and Santa Clara extends the lead back on top by two once more, 3-1 to one here in the fifth inning. And that'll bring out Stan Stolte from the first base dugout. Rebels had a pitcher warming up. Trying to identify who it is before we step aside. Let him get warmed up on the mound. Sam Simon lifted after four and one-third innings. As the big right hitter, Matt Maloney, heads out to try to take over and limit the damage in the fifth. Simon, able to go through four and a third innings, leaves after allowing three runs on eight hits. And at the top of the fifth, We'll step aside for the pitching change with UNLV trailing 3-1. to one. The New Mexico State transfer, Matthew Maloney, takes over here with one out and one on in the top of the fifth inning. Sam Simon bounced after four and a third. Maloney going up against Ben Steck, who has flied out twice. He hope to get a ground ball with a double play active up the middle. Over the top delivery from the right as he misses down and away with a fastball to Steck. Maloney 
Pitching for the sixth time this year, he has yet to allow a run earned or otherwise. Two hits over six frames, one strikeout and one walk. Opponents batting just 100 against the right-hander out of Southern California as he misses outside. The Huntington Beach native, the senior transfer from New Mexico State out of the WAC. Pitching in his first year for the Scarlet and Gray. Works out of the stretch with Efren Manzo on first base. Blows a heater by Ben Steck, who swings and misses for strike one. Rebels will be looking to Maloney to really come in and dominate like he's done so far this year with uh, hits coming at a premium for the Rebels right now at the plate against Pilchard. They keep the run total down. Slider elevated but in the strike zone for strike two to even up the count. A beautiful pitch to Steck. Maloney's a good-looking kid. He's a guy that believes in the weight room, nutrition side of the being an athlete. He overthrows right there. Pitch in the dirt with the runner breaking a second, and the throw not in time. J.P. Heff trying to apply the tag, but Manzo swipes second. His second steal and as many tries on the year, and that wipes out the double play possibility. That's the aggressiveness of the Broncos, and that's what made them successful so far this year. So the count goes full with one down. Dylan Joyce on deck. Maloney set at the belt. The pitch swung on and popped high in the air down the first base side. Foul ground as the first baseman Krizik Runs out of room on the pursuit. We'll have to try that one again on three and two. I'm a kind of a romantic for the stolen base back in, especially the MLB days when you had Lou Brock and Davey Lopes and all the guys that really made the game. I mean, Ricky Henderson was unbelievable. You just don't see that anymore. Vince Coleman, The Rock, Tim Raines, as Maloney misses high for ball four. Not the worst walk here as it does set up a double play, but the extra base runner brings up Dylan Joyce, who has walked and driven in a run on a double, not necessarily the batter you want to give more base runners to. No, there's a chance, though, for Maloney to keep that ball down low, hopefully get Joyce to roll over on something, get the double play, and get out of the inning. Joyce hitting 323 coming into the game. Stands in from the right. Big bodied first baseman against the former catcher, Matt Maloney, who gets a swing and a miss on a fastball pushed by him in the low 90s. Man. He was sitting all over that fastball, but Maloney was able to locate that away from him. Not able to catch up with that one. Maloney on 0 1. Deals off the outside. Holding up on a check swing is Joyce. No appeal down from Seeger. I think that was a little closer than we think. I think we were both on the same page there, partner. Count even at one. One's across the board with runners on first and second. Three to one the score in the fifth. Maloney. On the overhand delivery, misses down and outside. And now Maloney falling behind. Last time he pitched was a week ago today. Maloney got one out on four pitches against New Mexico, and that was it. Only time he was used over the three-game set. Rebels unable to get anything going against the Lobos as Joyce pops this one deep to right field. Higgins in right, runs out of room. It's off the tree and out of here. A three-run home run for Dylan Joyce. His first of the year. And that extends the lead now 6-1. to one. Santa Clara leading in the fifth. Maloney made a mistake there. Kept that ball up in the zone. He's able to drive that ball. And that ball hit up the pine tree over the Cox sign in right field. All he could do was look up. And that ball, we're, I'm going to guess, is 420. Oh, that thing was still carrying. Yeah, hit about three-quarters of the way up the tree, if not more. Here's the first pitch and the follow-up. Misses high to Malcolm Williams, who is one of two with a single and a strikeout. Maloney allowing his first earned runs of the year in his, set, his sixth outing. And he misses high once again to Williams. So one of those three runs charged to Simon. It'll close the book on the starter. Manzo scoring. We'll finish the book on Sam Simon. Four runs all earned on eight hits, two walks and a strikeout. Over those four and a third innings, he threw 81 pitches. Williams squares to bunt, pulls it back on a pitch call for strike one. Two balls and one strike to tally. That carry by Joyce right there wasn't as far as I thought it was going to be, but it did leave the bat at 105 miles an hour, 387 feet estimated. The 2-1. Called ball three off the outside. Did you see yesterday there was a home run hit by Giancarlo Stanton in spring training action, 116 miles an hour off the bat? Yeah, now, that's with a wooden bat. Think about what those guys would do with these types of bats. 
Ball four as Williams takes a five pitch walk. Brings up Jordan Lewis with one out and one on now. Six to one the score. Yeah, it's uh, funny. Not the first 116 plus mile an hour exit velocity home run hit by John Carlos Stanton. Not by a long shot. He's actually the leader in that category since they started tracking it in 2016. No that, surprise there. Well, that ball, that bat is a toothpick in his hands, too. <laughs> there was a lot made of his uh, figure when he showed up to spring training this year. He slimmed down, although I don't think it really matters for a guy like that with that kind of natural strength as Lewis takes strike one. Maloney's going to have to do a pretty good job of keeping the runner on here. The Broncos are a threat to move again here. Williams. Williams at first. A throw over to first and a bang-bang play, but he's able to get back in head first and safely. Williams, who swiped third earlier, now three for four in stolen bases on the year. Maloney throws over again, but the throw twists Krizik to his left, unable to apply the tag. Williams likely would have been back in there anyway. That home run hit by Joyce. Not only the first run set Maloney is allowed, it's the first extra base hit of the year that he surrendered. The runner breaks, the pitcher calls strike, the throw in time. Applying the tag is J.P. Heft. Caught stealing two to four. That's a huge out to take a base runner off and potentially stop the bleeding in the fifth. Well, good pitch to run on right there as that slider moved across the place, but that was a great throw by Seeger right there, right at the bag, easy tag. First runner we've thrown out tonight. Now the 0-2 pitch cut on and missed. That inning took a turn quickly. However, damage done in a major way as Santa Clara is able to scratch across four runs, including three on one swing. A Dylan Joyce home run extends the lead. And through four and a half innings, it is Santa Clara six, UNLV one. UNLV Baseball is presented by Intermountain Health. Here to be a part of your Las Vegas life. More importantly, here to help you live an even healthier one. Intermountain Health, official health partner of UNLV Athletics. Matt Neverett, along with Dan Dolby here from early Wilson Stadium. Heading into the bottom of the fifth, a five-run lead for the visiting Broncos of Santa Clara. And a new arm on the mound. Right-hander wearing number 14 is Cole Kitchen. Spelled just like the room. Leading things off for the Rebels. Paul Myro IV as... The shortstop takes a called strike one from Kitchen, who replaces Cade Pilchard. Kitchen making his fifth outing, his second out of the pen this year. Myro hits one high in the air, but shallow to center field. Heading back and now in is Coleman Brigman. Center fielder's got it on the move. That's five straight Rebel batters retired as Myro pops out on the first pitch he sees. And now Kitchen up against the top of the Rebel lineup with one out and nobody on. Very impressive outing by 
young man Pilcher for the Broncos. Not unlike the two pitchers that we saw last night, very solid for the Bronco pitching staff. So Kitchen will be able to try to keep that momentum going. Second pitch, swung on and fouled back by Ryland Charles. It's interesting by Charles to see it as aggressive an approach there. Typically, one pitch, one out is an automatic take for the next hitter, but Charles does have the green light just about every regard. And he's earned it over his collegiate career as he takes inside now to even it at one. That's just to trust that Coach Higgins, the hitting coach, has in Ryland Charles, although he's not where he needs to be in the batting average, he's going to start coming around here. He's 0 for 2 today. As he rips this one, but fouled on the first base side. Charles behind 1 and 2. Final line for Pilchard, who does not qualify for a win, didn't toss long enough into the game. Over four innings, he threw 66 pitches. He was efficient, gave up one run on two hits while walking two and striking out three. He will leave with a no decision in a 6-1 to one game. Charles takes down and inside. Meanwhile, for Sam Simon, again, his final line, four and a third. Four runs, all earned on eight hits with two walks and just the one strikeout. Simon on the hook for the loss if the score were to hold. Change up outside from Kitchen. And Charles, who has grounded out and flied out, is the count full. Three balls, two strikes, one out. J.P. Heft on deck. Kitchen out of the full windup, rocks and deals. Charles jumps out of his shoes and fouls that elevated heater back over the screen. Not unlike we talked about with Krizik. Full count, you're going to see a lot of pitches that are fouled off here by Rylan Charles until he gets selected, selected with one, something in the zone that he thinks he can take. A couple of guys with great bat control batting near the top of the lineup for Stan Stulte. Charles rips this one down the right field side, rolling all the way to the fence. Charles with extra bases. He rounds first. He's on his horse to second. Slows up as the throw goes to the cutoff man. Rylan Charles with a one-out double, his sixth of the year. That's got to be a good feeling. He roped that thing down the line. Yeah, we'll check the exit velocity on that one, but that's just a good piece of hitting by Ryland. Waited on a fastball there and was able to turn on that one with his speed is easily into second base standing up. So Rebels got to get something Go and take advantage of this one-out double by Ryland Charles. How about 99 miles an hour on the exit velocity? Hard hit ball. That's the example of Ryland getting his pitch, fouling off. Pitches in the zone, but not quite hitter's pitches, per se. And taking advantage as Heft fouls the first pitch back off the chest protector of the catcher, Ben Steck. Pretty interesting. New pitcher coming into the game. After facing Pilcher, all three Rebel batters have swung at the first pitch. You'll see that more often with the reliever than a starter, but not a guy like Kitchen, who has started a ton throughout his career, including each of the last two years exclusively. He bounces one in. On the count, even a half who has singled and flied out to left. One of the challenges that Kitchen has had over his career is the amount of free passes that he does give up. So, again, scouting report earlier in this year, maybe he's a little more effective early in the count. As he misses low to half. Count goes two and one. Yeah, he's pitching in his fifth year for Santa Clara. He is 1-0 oh with a 6-even ERA coming into this outing. He works out of the stretch. His 2-1 pitch is chopped up the middle. Behind the base at second is the shortstop, Williams. It's under his glove and into center field. Rounding third and scoring easily is Ryland Charles. RBI number 14 for J.P. Heft on a base hit. He's now 2-3, for three and the Rebels taking a bite into the deficit. They now trail by a 6-2 to score. Yeah, we talked about his prowess at the plate earlier. Has just kind of been a machine for the Rebels. You don't think about him very much. He plays a really good defensive second base. But at this point, J.P. Hess hitting 380 for the Rebels. So they'll be looking to get something going after scoring one with Ryland Charles coming around. Try to keep some momentum going, get after Kitchen a little bit more. Iron, open stance from the right as he's choked up on the bat slightly. Fouls the first pitch off down the first base side. Yeah, five years, including this year for... Cole Kitchen, career 407 ERA, 14 to 9 record in 56 outings, 40 starts. He had been exclusively a starter each of the last two years. This just his second outing out of five in the bullpen this year. This one off the hand almost as Rodriguez I was off, off the, the knob of the bat as well. So it is a foul ball as he tries to shake that off. Sometimes 
you'll see the acting job. And we saw Rodriguez basically bait a ball for call earlier, so we know he's got the acting chops for it. Uh, it's Stan Stolte out there arguing. And typically with those ones, too, you'll see guys take the glove off and go, hey, look, there's visual evidence that it did hit me in the hand. Yeah, and he's grabbing his left thumb. Trainer Oscar Lopez went out there to take a look, and they're going to bring in the umpires. The home plate umpire, Joseph Penna, met with Stan Stolte. Really all that Stan can do is ask for a second opinion, and that looks like what we have here. Yeah, but that's one's going to be hard to overturn coming from a first or a third base umpire unless they see something distinctively that he got hit, probably going to end up with just a cold strike there, or a fouled strike. A lot of times, too, it's the auditory element. You hear the hand versus the knob of the bat. True. The issue with this is that all four of those, or all three other umpires, are at least 40 yards away, mm -hmm. probably 100 feet plus away from the plate. Meanwhile, Joseph Penna, uh, about a foot behind where the, the contact was made. Although this is kind of an extended umpire meeting for a call like this. And, and again, to your point, they may be talking about the audio <laughs> piece of this if... It got him on the thumb. Not going to get any. <laughs> they're asking Coach Stolte <laughs> to back up. <laughs> he's he's not within 30 feet of him, and they're asking him to back up a couple more steps. But anyways, if there's no sound coming off that because the ball is hitting a thumb, that's one of the things that they could be talking about. A super secret umpire meeting. Stan Stolte on the, the skirt, the turf that surrounds home plate. I think it was the third base umpire, Brooks O'Hearn, that kind of gave him the, the get back, coach. You can't hear what we're saying. So now they... They're going to look at it. Yeah, they break up the meeting, and they're going to ask Isaac Rodriguez to take off the glove and show them evidence. This is this is this, a positive development. This is, but this does <laughs> not happen very often. No, as they're going to look. To your point, a lot of times the batter, the batter will take his batting glove off instinctively. They're actually ask, having him take it off per request. They're literally looking at it. They're touching it. If it's hot, he got hit. If I'm Rodriguez, I'm reacting like I just got shot. Yeah, they're literally rubbing him down as if they were checking for pine tar on a pitcher. They're asking to see the other hand now. They need a point of reference. This is going to be very interesting <laughs> to see. If he does get a free pass here, I'm going to bet we're going to get a, ma a visit from and they Rusty Filter. Send him to first. And here he comes. Before they even finish the point, here comes Rusty Filter. <laughs> Isaac Rodriguez in the running for next year's Oscars. That's twice today. Get that man a trophy. That's a man who got on base with a walk on three on three <laughs> balls. <laughs> and now he sold a hit thumb on his bat. <laughs> and Rusty Filter is not very happy about what's going on right now. The crew chief, Alberto Ruiz, with his palms to the sky, you have to say, what do you want me to do? We looked. It hit him. This is a, a very interesting development as Rodriguez has now reached three times without an at-bat. He's walked twice. He's been hit by a pitch. And Rusty Filter starting to get into it with Alberto Ruiz, the crew chief. He takes a step away, and Filter gives him his parting thoughts. And I'm sure that that was uh, oh, anything was a, but a friendly conversation. It was a uh, Irish greeting. <laughs> Very fitting here on the day of St. Patrick. So after all of that, Isaac Rodriguez with his second time on first, much to the, the test of Rusty Filter, on first. Now two on, one down for Kate Higgins. Just a, a weird sequence of events for Isaac Rodriguez in his plate appearances this afternoon. Higgins with an RBI base hit and a strikeout so far. He takes a first pitch strike from Kitchen, who had been throwing back and forth with the third baseman Manzo during that extended break. Rodriguez off of first, heft off second. They're keeping an eye on the lead runner, shortstop Williams in his back pocket. Higgins hits one to shallow right center field, fading and falling for a base hit. The runners had to hold up about halfway between their respective bases to make sure that that one dropped, but heft moves to third. Rodriguez with two good working hands on at second. Kate Higgins now two for three. That'll low the bases. For Austin Krizik, this is the exact situation the Rebels won here in the fifth. And that ball looked like off the bat it was coming off a lot harder. That ball was retrieved by O'Hare. But with, to your point, the ba base runners having to hold to make sure that ball wasn't caught. Loads up the bases for 
Probably the guy that you would pick to have in this situation. Nowhere to put Austin Krizik as he takes a first pitch fastball high from Cole Kitchen. Krizik with two flyouts. He's ended each inning in which he's come to bat prior. Finished the first with the pop out to right. Finished the third as he was robbed of a base hit by Coleman Brigman in center. He swings and misses at a changeup fading away from him. Could almost see the eyes light up from behind him as yeah. he tried to hammer that pitch to left. He was thinking fastball. Got way out in front of that thing. Kitchen set with the bases loaded here in the fifth. The 1-1. Call for a strike mm. on the outside. Elevated and near the boundary. But a good job by the catcher Steck to bring it back in for strike two. It's a couple times we've seen, seen him, Steck, frame some balls up probably outside the zone. There's action in the pen behind Cole Kitchen as he deals. He spins a breaking pitch into the dirt, and the count goes even at two to Krizik. Right-hander throwing behind Kitchen in the bullpen. Six to one, six to two, beg your pardon. Cal Pauly, or Santa Clara with the lead. Krizik twists this pitch into the right field bleacher seats, and inside out did a great job of Keeping the hands inside the baseball somehow. Able to do that with that one at his kneecaps. And inside. Yeah. Just a good pitch. And he's not going to take a chance. He wants to be foul something off till he gets something he likes. Count even at two. Catcher sets up away. The pitch goes high. And the count goes full. Three that, balls, two strikes, and one out. That was a called pitch right there. Catcher Steck was almost standing straight up by the time the ball was out of Kitchen's hand. Brendan O'Sullivan on deck with the bases loaded. Here's the 3 2 to Krizik. It's high. It's inside. It's ball four. It's an RBI number 24 on the year for Kriz. And the Rebels now trail it 6 to 3. Scoring from third is Heft. Rodriguez to third. Kate Higgins up to second. And Krizik reaches for the first time today. Uh, not how we would prefer to get a run batted in, but he'll take them however he can get them. That brings up Brendan O'Sullivan in a primetime RBI spot. All of a sudden, the tying run on first and Krizik. With one out here in the fifth, O'Sullivan struck out on three pitches against Kate Pilchard in the fourth. Probably very happy to see a different arm out there in the fifth. He takes a first pitch strike right down the chute, and O'Sullivan behind, no balls and a strike. O'Sullivan just looking to get some into the outfield. If it falls good, getting that extra run right now and cutting the deficit too would be huge. He swings and pops it up behind home plate. The catcher's tech loses the mask, can't find it in the sun. Can't find it anywhere as it bounces into the seats behind home plate for strike two. Well, Sullivan's going to have to be a good two-out hitter right now because I don't think that uh, even with the bases loaded here, I don't think Kitchen's going to offer up anything close to the zone. The left fielder Lewis is playing away from the line. Center fielder Brigman playing him to go the opposite way slightly as well. The 0-2 high on the slider. That was a designed miss as O'Sullivan... With a 1-2 count against him. By the way, just got the note from UNLV Sports Information Director Jake Reaney. Today is the 172nd game in a row that the Rebels have not been shut out. Finding ways to score runs has been their M.O. This one's popped up again behind home plate. Catcher Steck trying to track it. He's near the net. Moving towards the dugout, it bounces off the wall and back into the field of play. Steck lightly crashing his chest into the padded wall. The ball stayed in the side of the netting in foul territory that ball caromed off the top of the fence there almost cut stuck right back in the face yeah there's a, a pad there but on top there is you know the concrete it looked like it hit a corner and that's an example of playing on the road not necessarily knowing the area around True. the fence you see with outfielders a lot but you don't see it as often with the catchers santa clara out of the wcc leading six to three and here's the one-two from Kitchen to O'Sullivan. He swings and misses, waving at a changeup way off the outside. O'Sullivan now over two with a couple of Ks. Base is loaded. Now two down. And Santino Panaro looks to take a bite into this lead. Yeah, I like Santino coming up, hitting from the left side here. Con good contact hitter. You're seeing the left fielder Lewis move inside, taking a few steps towards the line and in as he knows. From a scouting report, Panaro goes the opposite way. But he also has some power down the right field line. So right fielder O'Hara shaded more towards center. 
Definitely spaced down both lines for Pinaro as he squares to bunt on the first pitch. Pulls it back on a called strike one. I don't think the intention was ever to actually no. drop one down no. there. Pinaro, who's 0 for 2, falls behind if nothing in one. He struck out and he's popped out to the shortstop and foul ground on the third base line. He swings and fouls a fastball straight back. That was the pitch that he would love to see again. Yeah, he just uh, mistimed that one. Ball away from him, fastball kind of tailing away from the left-handed hitter. Now this gives Kitchen a lot of opportunity to not throw anything that Bonaro might like to drive. Rodriguez on third, Higgins on second, Austin Krizik on first after a bases loaded walk. The 0-2 to Santino Panaro is high, maybe a bit inside as well for ball one from Kitchen. Kitchen last, last pitched six days ago against UC Davis. Went four innings in a start. With two runs, one earned on just one hit. He walked a pair. He's walked a batter in every one of his outings so far, including today, his fifth. The one-two up and away. And the count goes even to Santino Panaro. Now Kitch is going to have to work into the zone. So Panaro could be sitting on something that he really likes right now. Kitchen does not want to go 3-2 against Panaro. Takes the sign from the catcher's stick. Comes set and deals on two and two. Panaro lines it right back up the middle for a base hit. Rodriguez scores. Higgins gets the wave around third. The throw from the center fielder is cut off. It's a two RBI base hit with two out and two strikes from Santino Panaro. Just a masterful piece of hitting there. And all of a sudden, it's a one-run game at 6-5. to five. Panaro does a really good job. And we talked about earlier in the year, he was really struggling. But over the course of the last 10 games, he's really picked things up. Again, we talked about him being down 0-2 in that count. Works some things outside the zone. Real choosy. Able to take something right up the middle. Almost takes the head off of Kitchen. Scoring two for the Rebels. Seeger with a chance to tie the game. He swings at a first pitch fastball and pops it into the seats down the right field side. Seeger, the ninth batter of the inning for UNLV. He has grounded out and lined out in his two plate appearances to this point. Prime time RBI, RBI opportunity. Chance to be Captain Clutch. Checks the swing on a high fastball. Yes, he did, says home plate umpire Joseph Pena. No appeal needed. So Seeger falling behind nothing and two after Panaro dropped behind nothing and two. It's actually the third straight batter that Kitchen has gotten ahead of nothing and two after walking Krisic with the bases loaded. He's set on nothing and two. The pitch high and tight. Nearly clipped the helmet of Bailey Seeger. Nearly got the brim, but he's able to get it out of the way. You would love to get hit by a pitch and extend the inning, but that's one that your uh, yeah. basic human instinct takes <laughs> over, yeah. Face level right there. You're just trying to get the heck out of the way. It's one thing to get hit in the leg. It's another to get hit in the helmet. On one and two, Kitchen deals. Seeger swings and misses behind a fastball for out number three. But in the fifth, the Rebels send all nine batters to the plate. They were able to scratch across four runs on four hits. There were no errors and a pair stranded on. After five innings of play, we've got ourselves a one-run game. It's Santa Clara 6, UNLV 5.
Matthew Maloney back out for the top of the sixth inning. UNLV a whole lot closer than when he entered into the game. His first pitch outside to Ben Cleary for ball number one. Maloney entered into a contest and uh, gave up a three-run bomb to Dylan Joyce. First runs, first extra base hit that the hard-throwing right-hander has allowed on the year. But the bats backing him up in the bottom of the fifth inning as the pitch low for ball two to Cleary. Four runs for UNLV, including Charles, Heft, Rodriguez, and Higgins all reaching and scoring in order as the top four batters in the lineup. Any coach loves to see that on the scorebook. Cleary takes a strike. Maloney using that cutter with regularity. It's a really great, kind of a unique pitch, especially at this level. Absolutely. Another big body guy, not unlike Sam Simon. Sam Simon's a little more smooth. Maloney has got a little bit of a violent motion to him, especially even with that that slider. And that's great because out of the hand, it looks the same as the fastball. Yeah, it tunnels it really well. And he's behind Cleary, though, three and one. As the number nine batter in the lineup for Santa Clara. Fastball popped up down the right field side. Fading towards foul ground is Kate Higgins. And he'll watch this one go off the fence in foul territory for strike two. I think it's really key for Maloney to keep Cleary off the base here. You got speed coming up in the lineup, and they're going to run. To look at what Cleary has done. He's one for one on stolen bases this year. They're going to be trying to generate some more runs. The 3-2 in there. Call for strike three. Maloney struck out Lewis to end the fifth. He freezes Cleary on a called strike three to start the sixth. And Maloney with the bat starting to find some momentum, finding the Ks as well. Yeah, good pitch right there. He froze Cleary. I'm not sure what Cleary was looking for. That fa fastball was on the inside part of the plate. Get that all-important first out here. Get out of this inning. Keep some momentum going at the plate for the Rebels next inning. Leadoff man John John Baring swings at a first pitch changeup way ahead of that one and falls behind nothing and one. He is one for three with a stolen base and a run scored thus far. I don't think we're going to make the hour 55 mark today. No, not the same as last night. His Baring to that point pops it up on the second pitch of the at-bat to Panaro in left who's underneath it. Four out number two, two up and two away from Maloney as Coleman Brigman stands in. Yeah, you got a uh, one hour and 52 minute gem last night of a game. It was nice, but the pace of it for all pitchers, all four pitchers, well, actually, Broncos actually brought in a third pitcher last night, but everybody was working at a really high pace. Plus, you had 25 strikeouts, not a lot of deep counts. It was a nice night. Two out, nobody on for Coleman Brigman. He swings at the first pitch and lines it to left. A lot of top spin as it fades in front of Santino Panaro for a base hit. Brigman with a wide turnaround first and throw into second. He's now two for four with a pair of singles. And that brings up Michael O'Hara. Brigman is eight for eight on stolen or for stolen bases this year. So, again, with two outs, you might see something working here. Broncos will try to extend this lead after giving up four in the bottom of the fifth. Maloney trying to limit the damage to just a two-out single here in the top of the sixth inning in a six-to-five game. A token throw to first, not the best move as Brigman dives in way ahead of it. That's just to let him know he's thinking about him over there. Michael O'Hara, left-handed batter. One of just two lefties in the lineup today for Rusty Filter. Maloney throws a cutter, breaks over the outside for a strike. Count nothing in one. O'Hara has singled doubled and dropped down a sacrifice bunt two for two Maloney the converted catcher who transferred from New Mexico State last year gives up a high drive yanked deep down the right field side but well foul and held in the field of play bullpen arm hops over the fence to go retrieve it as the counts nothing and two to the right fielder O'Hara O'Hara was sitting on that pitch Maloney delivered it right down the middle just out in front of it just a little bit 0-2 with two outs here. Loney's going to have to keep, keep something out of the zone, hopefully away from O'Hara. Seeger sets up on the outside. Here's the 0-2 pitch. Way up and away. That one slipped out of the hand. Maloney kind of yeah. freezing when he planted the foot. He was uh, amazed at that. I'm, I'm always curious, how does that pitch catch a pitcher by surprise? <laughs> You're the one throwing it. 1-2. <laughs> With two down and a runner on. Here's the pitch. 
Cutter fought off the hands and popped into the Santa Clara dugout. Nice bare hand stab made by a bench bat down on the third base side. No, no fear in Maroon down there. He had a glove in one hand, but caught it with his bare bare hand. You know, the glove just for show when you're not on the field, I guess. So we'll try that one again. The score six to five. Santa Clara out hitting the Rebels ten to six. Maloney delivers fastball called for strike three on the outside corner. Maloney with three strikeouts over the last five batters he's faced. Retires the side in four hitters in the top of the sixth inning. UNLV due up next in the bottom of the sixth with Paul Myro to lead things off. Tying run to lead it off in a six to five score. Paul Myro the fourth, who led off the fifth inning for UNLV, leads off the sixth, although he'll do it in a very different situation when he led off in the fifth. The Rebels were down six to one. When he leads off in the sixth, in just a moment, it is a six to five game. Rebels able to play four runs in their last trip to the dish against Cole Kitchen, who's back out for second inning of work. Kitchen, who's pitching out of the pen for the second time this season, gets ahead on a called strike, a letter high heater to Myro. Begins his third plate appearance after getting hit by a pitch and flying out to center. He hits this one on the ground, a third, picked up by Manzo, and it was in the air. He got it. No catch. The throw to first is not in time. One umpire says no catch. The other says a catch. First base umpire overruling the third base umpire. Third base ump was about five feet behind the play. First base umpire, the crew chief, Alberto Ruiz, supersedes him, and it will be an out. That was a quick hit. Manzo stabbed it. And in real time, thought that it might have been in the air, but it's interesting when a guy from across the field overrules. It's a matter of proximity versus viewpoint from the yeah. umpire's perspective. Well, absolutely. And I think he got the, they got the call right there. O'Hearn was behind the third baseman. Monzo didn't have the best view. Charles swings to the first pitch, pulls it just foul down the first base side. That yeah, was by a matter of an inch. And Ryland Charles tried to jump all over that first pitch from Kitchen as these UNLV hitters stay aggressive against the bullpen arm for Santa Clara. Ruiz was emphatic making that call, so he clearly thinks that he has a better line on that ball for that first out, but hard hit ball by Myro. Charles hits this one hard. In the air to right field, but playable for Michael O'Hara. Couple of steps back for the right fielder, battling with the sun as he uses the glove to shield the eyes and is able to stab it for out number two. Quickly, two up and two away on a pair of hard hit balls for the Rebels. Brings up J.P. Heff with nobody on in front of him. Looking at the numbers on Kitchen so far, been fastball, slider, changeup. The fastball is 89 to 91. Slider 80 to 83. That changeup's working pretty effectively for him at 82. It was a fastball right down the middle. Heft watches it for a called strike one. JP, two for three, an RBI on a base hit in the fifth inning. He came around to score when Krizik took ball four with the sacks full. He takes another strike on another fastball from Kitchen, and he's trying to go one, two, three for the first time. Rebels were set down in order in the second, the fourth, 
And Heft hopes to break that streak here in the six as he takes a bouncing ball in the dirt for ball number one. After today, the Rebels take on St. Mary's, welcoming in the Gales on a Tuesday-Wednesday non-conference series right here at Earl E. Wilson Stadium. Heft leans away from that slider that stays up and in. Two balls, two strikes with two outs in the sixth inning. 6.05 first pitch on Tuesday, 2.05 first pitch on a Wednesday afternoon. The 2-2. Down low for ball three. And then, of course, as you had mentioned, Dan, Silver State Showdown this weekend up in Reno. Yeah, it's a big series as we head back into conference play. Now to the full line. Kitchen deals on a 3-2 as Heft lifts it to center field. Brinkman started back, but the center fielder now drifts in and on an underhand catch retires the side, loving it for out number three. Man, the even-numbered innings have not been kind to the Rebels at the bat. They go down in order in the second, in the fourth, and now in the sixth in a 1-2-3 fashion. And after six innings full here from early Wilson Stadium, it's Santa Clara 6, UNLV 5. Top of the seventh, six to five. Santa Clara leads it as Matt Maloney stands back out. He came in with one out and two on in the fifth inning. After giving up a three-run home run, he's allowed just two base runners on a walk and a single since. Three strikeouts over that stretch. His first pitch misses low to the cleanup man. Efren Manzo is the middle third of the Santa Clara lineup. Gets it going against Maloney in the seventh. Really good and efficient in the sixth inning as he retired the side and four batters. Manzo goes the other way, puts a charge into it deep to right. Higgins back into the fence. He leaps, and it's out of here. Sneaking over the yellow line on an opposite field home run by Efren Manzo. It's his team-leading sixth bomb of the year. It's the third time in as many at-bats that he's reached and scored, and that's a big-time run that extends the lead to two. Very similar to Austin Krizik's home run last night. Didn't look like it had a lot of juice on the ball, but that thing just got up and started carrying. Kate Higgins in right field knew that one was going to get out of here, made a sprint to the fence, leaped up, but even being a 6'3 right fielder, he's not able to get that off that over that 12-foot fence out there in right center. Maloney, after not allowing an extra base hit in his first five appearances, has now given up two home runs on the day. He surrendered five bombs in 25 outings last year at New Mexico State on the hill. His first pitch in the follow-up effort uh, after the home run is up and into Ben Steck, who takes called ball one. He's 0 for 2. He's walked and flied out twice. So Maloney looking to come back after the lead extended to 7 to 5. Knee-high fastball call for ball two to Steck. Well, this is a, a busy sporting day, not only on the campus, but across campuses in the country as Selection Sunday is upon us. I think it should be a national holiday <laughs> as it's popped up <laughs> high in the air, deep to left. We'll get back to the uh, important matters at hand as Rylan Charles calls off the shortstop Myro and gloves it for out number one. That brings up Dylan Joyce with nobody on and, and one out. It is interesting to see the different reactions. It was a really weird conference tournament season in, on the hardwood for the men. 
There were 18 number one seeds that did not win their conferences. It is a lot of parity across the board in college basketball this year. Well, that's what makes March Madness so special. Oh, yeah. And I think the okay. holidays should be Thursday and Friday of next next week. Yeah. The first two days of the tournament are phenomenal. First pitch high to Joyce. Yeah, the uh, Mountain West tournament, no exception. Just some, some great results. And the conference was, I'm sure, rooting for New Mexico to move on and win the tournament, not because they you know, have, or have any partiality to the Lobos, but because the Mountain West is now a six-bid conference. Did you ever think you would see the day? Absolutely not. Even the back in the days when BYU and Utah were in the conference. Joyce swings and misses at an elevated heater. And the count goes one and one. Yeah, it was a really great tournament season overall, but for the Mountain West, there were five teams that were locks as far as their... Non-con, the way they played in conference plays. Joyce takes strike two. New Mexico was the only one really on the bubble. So for the Lobos to run the table and win the tournament, they only trailed in the conference tournament for 42 seconds. They were nearly wire to wire in every game. I did have no idea about that. Yeah, they were on top early, and they held on to plenty of leads. As Joyce swings and misses at strike three. Fourth strikeout for Maloney is out number two in the seventh. And with two outs, nobody on pre-stretch break. It brings up Malcolm Williams. That New Mexico team dangerous come tournament time as well. They have great guard play, Mashburn and House. They've got a really good freshman forward in J.P. Toppin. And they've Co got player of the year. Yeah. No, freshman of the year. Yeah, along with UNLV's D.J. Thomas. This is the first pitch outside to Williams. Yeah, that, that New Mexico team, a scary one. They're a bad matchup for a lot of teams that – you know, really struggle to guard on the outside because they're so quick and they're so fast with the depth that they have in the backcourt. And they play like their hair is on fire. Yeah, especially Jalen House. <laughs> <laughs> as, uh, he is as frantic as you'll see a uh, defender on the outside. Could it's be interesting, though. You know, the last multiple years, we've had five conference tournaments here in Las Vegas yeah. losing the Pac-12 next year. So town will slope down a little bit, not by much. Just the four conference tournaments, yeah. As a ground ball ripped right to short, picked up on one hop by Paul Myro. Low throw that Krizik's unable to dig out at first. Turning and heading to second is Williams. The throw from Krizik to the base at second is high. It's not in time as Williams reaches on a two base throwing error by Paul Myro, the fourth. We talked about Williams' ability to move around the base pass. Once he saw that ball, it was going to get by Krizik, it was easily into second base. That's a ball that. Paul Myra would like to have back. He didn't uh, field it real clean, but didn't make a strong throw over to Krizik. Krizik wasn't able to pick that one. Yeah, kind of a weird in-between hop. You either want the short hop or the long hop uh, coming across if you're a first baseman. We want the runner on second, Jordan Lewis. Swings and pulls the first pitch straight back to the screen for strike one. I'll tell you what, though, a lot of these Mountain West teams are uh, bad matchups in the NCAA tournament. I don't think anybody in the country wants to face San Diego State. No, I mean, they're just a tough matchup. They're going to beat you up. They're going to not necessarily put a lot of bo points on the board, but they're going to keep you off also. Overhand curveballs in for strike two. And, yeah, they uh, – Ladie is – he's a beast. Semifinalist for the Naismith Player of the Year. His first year at San Diego State. It was uh, yeah, really interesting to watch him against UNLV. He was phenomenal. Ground ball pulled, but it's fouled on the third base side off the bat of Jordan Lewis. That would have been trouble – that was able to stay f uh, foul fair, just worked foul. Williams was going to score easily. Lewis was going to probably at least get to second, quite possibly third. Manzo led the inning off with a home run. It's been fly out, strike out, and an error ever since. With two strikes, Maloney rocks and deals. That pitch up and away, two balls and two strikes the count. Wind blowing softly in here on a... Beautiful St. Patrick's Day at early Wilson Stadium. One of the days where we'd almost rather be outside calling the game. Get us a, a spot in the bleachers. Maloney gives up a pop fly deep down the right field side, but way out of play for a foul ball. Count stays with two strikes. Tell you what, if we're sitting in the stands, though, it's, there's going to be a beverage and <laughs> roast beef sandwich for us. It was uh, $5 mimosas at uh, Swing and Sam's today. Well, I didn't specify the... Beverage could have been a soft drink, could have been a water, could have been something else. I'm just listing off our specials today. 
<laughs> it's a curveball in the dirt. Blocked by Seeger. Evens up the count at two. A little, little uh, cross promotion there. Go, uh, go full Harry Carey on the broadcast. <laughs> I'd like to pretend to be a professional. Huh? Although he, he could get away with it. One of the, one of the very few. Not sure he could get away with that these days. Though. Yeah, very true. Hey, if Bob Euchre can't, nobody can. On two and two, Maloney set. He deals. This one swung on and hit well into the gap in left center field. Turning and watching it go is Santino Panaro. He dives and can't get there in time. Scoring from second is Williams. Rounding second, heading to third is Lewis. No throw from Myro as the cutoff man puts it in the back pocket. And it's an RBI triple for Jordan Lewis. It's his second triple of the year, 12th RBI of the year. And that extends the Bronco lead to eight to five. Lewis was able to get that one into the gap. Santino Panaro makes a yeoman's effort, not able to come up with that. So that ball gets to the fence and speed kills. Lewis can motor. It is. Very impressive. This old Santa Clara team can really run. And here comes Stan Stolte out of the first base dugout. He'll pull the hook on Matthew Maloney as a reliever was warming up. And as the fence opens up, waiting to identify just who it is. So Maloney heads to the dugout. And now the right-hander, Reese Lewick, emerges from the bullpen down the right field side. Lewick for Maloney. We'll let him get warmed up and return after the pitching change. Eight to five here in the top of the seventh at early Wilson Stadium. Reese Lewick into the ball game, eight to five. Santa Clara on top, enters in with a runner on third and two down. First pitch swinging is Ben Cleary, who lifts it into left center field for a base hit. One pitch and a run allowed by Lewick. It'll be charged to Maloney as it makes the game nine to five. Maloney's line now closed after surrendering five runs all earned in two and a third innings. Just when the Rebels claw their way back into this one, Rebel pitching been a little suspect. Not what we're expecting from Maloney so far this season. It hasn't been his norm. Then Lewick comes in and gives a first pitch single to score the fourth run or four runs ahead of for the Broncos. First pitch from Lewick missing to John John Baring at the top of the lineup count. One ball, no strikes. He's one for four today. As he takes another strike. Lewick working with some pace as the count goes quickly, nothing and two. Lewick, a sophomore out of Palo Verde High School here in Las Vegas. Fifth outing of the year. He's without a decision in a 4-5 ERA in four innings on the campaign. Off of first is Cleary. The 0-2 pitch, a changeup outside for ball one. 14 so hits for the Broncos against the Hustling uh, Russell, Rebel staff today. Pair that up with four free passes 18 times on base today. His pitch outside. That doesn't even include the runner reaching on an error and a runner reaching on a fielder's choice. 
And this is not the team that you want to allow extra base runners on. Santa Clara really can motor, and they do it often. Throw to first, as we're saying that, sends Cleary back in diving headfirst and safely. So 9-5 to five here with two outs in the top of the seventh pre-stretch break. The Rebels sending the heart of their lineup up in the bottom of the frame. Rodriguez, Higgins, and then Krizik, the first three to get it going. Fastball in there for a strike to Bearing, and the count goes four at three and two. Off of first is Cleary. He'll be off with a pitch with a full count and two down. Lewick takes the sign from Seeger. Comes set at the belt. Throws to first. There's nobody there. It hits the base runner. A fortuitous bounce as Lewick in a miscommunication gets very, very lucky there. Not sure what Lewick got from a signal standpoint, but Krizik wasn't even close to the bag. Yeah. Typically with three, two, and two outs. First baseman will back off. The runner goes. A ground ball hit off the glove of the third baseman, O'Sullivan, and into left field. Cleary, who was off with the pitch, round second, heads to third. An error will put John John Bearing on for the second time as O'Sullivan trying to field its sidecar left. That thing had a ton of spin. Hit the dirt in front of him off the end of the glove and into left field. Yeah, that's one of the, you'd like to see O'Sullivan get his body over in front of. Although the ball that came off the bat pretty, pretty well hit. The top spin on it right there is what really can eat you up. So if you keep that ball in front of you, at least you have some type of shot. At the very least, you're going to keep the runner from advancing to third base. So what's this now? Jay Asher and Alberto Ruiz, the second and first base umpires, respectively coming together as Rusty Filter, who has a well-trodden path from that third base dugout to the third base umpire, Brooks O'Hearn, heads back. I can pretty much guarantee you you're going to have – a movement off first base here from Baring. He fakes a stolen base in the first pitch. Chopped to O'Sullivan at third. He's glad it this time, and he throws a strike to Krizik at first. So the error, a whole lot of nothing as the side retired, but Santa Clara able to add on three more runs on three hits, including a leadoff home run. There were two errors committed in the inning and two runners left on. It's the stretch break at early Wilson Stadium, and the Rebels trail the Broncos 8-5, to 9-5. Coming out of the stretch break in the bottom of the seventh inning, Rebels trail the Broncos 9-5 to five in the final game of what's turned into a two-game weekend set. Isaac Rodriguez takes ball one from Cole Kitchen, pitching in his third inning of work. Kitchen came in after Kate Pilchard threw four frames, allowing a run on two hits. Pilchard is, will leave, rather, with a no decision. Kitchen, so far, four runs all earned on four hits over two innings as Rodriguez takes a called strike one right down the middle, watching all the way on 2-0. Rodriguez has had an interesting afternoon at the plate, no doubt about it. Two walks, he's been hit by a pitch, he's scored a run, and he's been on a uh, razor's edge of reaching base on all three of his at-bats as he takes strike two. Basically, he worked his way on on a third ball. It was really a fourth ball. <laughs> We are still convinced that Joseph Penna behind home plate lost the count. <laughs> Rodriguez pops it into the seats on the first baseline to keep it 2-2. Two and two. 
He then walked the regular way on five pitches for them way outside the zone. He was then hit on the hand, and after Stan Stolte went out and convinced the four umpires to come together, they looked at his left hand, they looked at his right hand, they looked at his left hand again, put him on to first base, much to the detest of the head coach Rusty Filter for Santa Clara. And then he came around to score on a two RBI base hit from Santino Panaro. He watches up here to bring the count four, three, and two. One ball away from potentially walking for a fourth time. Yeah, this would be a really good opportunity for the Rebels to get a lead runner on here, try to generate something, get back into this game. And it's high for ball four. Rodriguez reaches for the fourth time. The on-base percentage taking a spike, although the batting average still sits at 344, where it was when he entered today. Good opportunity right now for the left-handed hitting Cade Higgins. Try to get the Rebels back into this ball game, and it's not one of those ones you're looking for crooked numbers. Three innings left, and just crawling your way back into this one. First pitch to Higgins. Swung on, pulled foul on a chopper on the first base side. Higgins, two for three. He's got base hits in his last two plate appearances after striking out looking against Cade Pilchard in the first. Meanwhile, the line final on Matthew Maloney. Five runs all earned on five hits. He threw two and a third innings on 50 pitches. He walked two. He struck out four. A little rosin bag conversation going on. It's been interesting to watch Kitchen. When he goes behind the mound like that, he's been putting his glove on the ground, taking it off the hand, something you don't, uh, you don't typically see at any level. Reese Lewick was able to retire the side on eight pitches, gave up a hit, then had an error behind him by Brandon O'Sullivan. Next batter hit it right to O'Sullivan again. He was able to glove it and throw to first in time for the out. The 0-1 swung on and missed. Higgins climbing the ladder on a fastball, and he trails no balls, two strikes. One of the surprising statistics for Higgy this year, although he's been doing well at the plate, he's hitting 369, but he only has one home run this year. Expectations were high for him to put the long ball in play a little bit more. Here's the pitch on 0-2. It bounces. Good stop by the catcher's stick to keep it in front. But that's one of the things you see from a guy like Higgy, who may not be hitting for power right now, but leading the team in doubles, able to produce runs, and then when he gets on base, he's scoring runs also. Off of first is Rodriguez. The one-two pitch. Fisted off the mm. glove of the first baseman, Joyce, in foul territory. So that keeps the count one and two. It looked like it was knuckling away from Joyce. Yeah. Thought he had a beat on that one, but it worked away from him. Yeah, kind of got that one near the hands and pushed it more so than got around it. This is another situation where Kitchens got his glove laying on the turf, and he's using dirt and rosin to try to get a grip. Nine to five the score. Rebels being out hit by the Broncos 14 to six. Santa Clara has had base runners on in every inning but one. Another one, two. Slider over the outside. Call for strike three. That one a beautiful pitch as Higgins takes a call third strike for the second time in four at bats today. A walk followed by a K brings up Krizik with one out and one on here in the bottom of the seventh inning. Well, the Rebels. After the weekend series in Reno next weekend, we'll have a fun game at the Las Vegas Ballpark on March 25th. That'll be next Monday, a week from tomorrow, as they take on Arizona State. Krizik lifts this one deep to left field. Going back is Lewis. Lewis in front of the warning track, stops and turns around. A couple of steps back in towards the field of play. He drops it. Was it on the exchange? Yes, ruled by the third base umpire, Brooks O'Hearn that he gloved it, and when he went to make the exchange to throw to second, that the ball popped out. So Krizik flies out deep to left, barely. And back to first goes Rodriguez with two down. Here's Brendan O'Sullivan, the Irishman looking for a hit on St. Patrick's Day. Always look forward to the uh, semi-neutral site games across town over at Las Vegas Ballpark. Those are fun. I'll be on the call. Will you be joining me on the call that night? I will not. It's one of my opportunities to spend time with administration and sponsors and clients. So you're going to be handling this one on your own. And you're going to be pretty, pretty, pretty good at what you do. So I, I'm not worried about it. I think I'll be all right. 
Yeah, so Sullivan takes high and tight. Count goes even at one. Yeah, that uh, those games are always fun. Always great to see Arizona State come in, kind of be able to gauge your talent against one of the premier teams traditionally in the country. And those games, a great opportunity for, for your sake to be able to uh, talk to clients, talk to sponsors, you know, help promote the program, which is a you know major part of your gig. Yeah, absolutely. And then we're actually going to be hosting the entire football coaching staff get out to a game and a bunch of the players are coming out try to show some support from cross sports here at UNLV. Uh, we got to get a rotating door coming up to the booth. I'd love to have a couple of on-air interviews as O'Sullivan stays alive poking that one down the first base side. Got to ask Barry Odom. I, I will make it a point <laughs> to have him on with me strictly to ask him about his bull riding experience. <laughs> I'm not sure he remembers it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure he wants to. <laughs> I've had numerous conversations with him post riding a bull at the Tough Edelman Bull Riding Classic. It was awesome. Yeah, really, really fun to watch. He took a took a licking and kept on ticking, as they say. Although I think anybody would have fallen off a bull like that. The Widowmaker. What a name. O'Sullivan lifts the one-two pitch to shallow right center field. Back goes Cleary, second baseman, backing up onto the outfield grass. Here comes the right fielder, O'Hara. He calls him off at the last moment as Cleary falls to get out of the way. Lead-off walk, stranded on base. His three straight putouts behind him retired the side in four batters. Coming out of the stretch break in the bottom of the seventh, on to the eighth we go. Three, four, five hitters do up for Santa Clara. The Broncos lead it nine to five. On to the eighth we go. Santa Clara leads UNLV 9-5 to five on a Sunday afternoon here in Las Vegas. Michael O'Hara, Efren Manzo, and Ben Steck, the three, four, and five hitters, leading it off for the visiting Broncos out of the WCC. All against the new left-hander into the game for the Rebels as Will Girardi gets ahead. Nothing and one against Michael O'Hara, firing a strike on a running fastball over the inside. And Girardi in his fifth outing of the year ahead, 0-1. Lefty works out of the full line and gives up a line drive, slapped to straightaway center field. Two steps straight backwards for Ryland Charles before he stops and makes the catch. A line out for O'Hara moves him to two for four with the sack bunt on the day and brings up the dangerous Efren Manzo, who has three hits in four bats, including two RBIs, a home run, a stolen base, and three runs scored. You're right, you mentioned seven innings. ERA did balloon up because he was one of the pitchers in that 31-run barrage that we gave to 
gave, took, accepted, whatever you, whatever want, to you want to call it, from New Mexico. Yeah, that game on the 9th of March, just a weird statistical anomaly as Girardi misses low. Count goes 2-0. and I saw it shared around, actually, on, on social media. You know, not often that college baseball comes into the, the forefront on social media, although it is more so nowadays than it has been in years past. But I saw a, a graphic as Girardi misses outside. It said, how, how do you feel to be UNLV? You score 15 runs and lose by 16 in the <laughs> game. Yeah, anytime you score 15 runs, you would expect to be in a ball game. Girardi on 3-0, and delivers, and misses inside. A four-pitch walk to Manzo. Puts him on for the fourth time in five plate appearances. Girardi has pitched in a number of games featuring a lot of runs this year. That game on the ninth, it was 31-15. to He's pitched in a 16-13 to game. Rebels falling to San Jose State here at Early Wilson Stadium. He pitched in the 15-1 to win at Utah Tech. And then he got the no decision over an inning in two-thirds and a 10-8 to win against Stanford in the midweek non-conference showdown. He spins a breaking ball between the legs of Seeger all the way back to the backstop on the wild pitch. And that puts Manzo in scoring position. He took a big turn, but scurries back to the base at second as Seeger retrieves it. So far on the year for Girardi, seven innings. He's allowed 17 runs, 13 of them earned. Although 11 of the 17 runs that he surrendered as a whole this year were in that game against New Mexico. Game like that, somebody's got to wear it as far as uh, giving up a lot of the offense. Unfortunately, somebody does. Ground ball left side. To his left is O'Sullivan. It's over his glove, and a base hit will advance the runner. Manzo moves from second to third on Steck's first hit of the game. Ben Steck now one for four with a walk and a run scored. Runners in the corners with one down as Dylan Joyce stands in after homering, doubling, walking, and striking out in his four bats. Put things in perspective on that uh, New Mexico loss. Football beat New Mexico this this year 56-14. So they were only able to put 14 <laughs> points on the board. <laughs> Baseball was able to put up 31 runs. Yeah, it was a better offense than the uh, the Lobos uh, on, on the gridiron for a lot of this year. And see what they do with the new coaching staff in Albuquerque. As Joyce takes down his homer to right field against Matt Maloney broke this game open in the fifth inning a three run shot that was the first extra base hit and runs that right hander Maloney had surrendered on the year Girardi misses low and away falling behind 2-0 Girardi the fourth pitcher used by Stan Stolte this afternoon Reese Lewitt came in and faced three batters got the final out of the seventh one third of an inning no runs charged to him although he did allow an inherited runner to score Lewitt gave up one hit on eight pitches, no walks, no Ks. He'll leave with a no decision. This one slapped the other way. Joyce with a foul ball pushed out of play to move the count two and one. And you talked about a new football coach at New Mexico. Out of 12 opponents next year, we're facing seven teams with new head coaches. Wow. That is incredible. So I a lot of early season scouting is going to be tough. Yeah, really. I didn't even, that didn't even cross my mind. As Girardi bounces a 2-1 curveball in. Count goes three balls and a strike. Oh. Who do we got? It's to go, go through the list. You got, obviously, Reno with the new head coach. Uh, we got new Mexico Houston, as well. Houston has a new coach. No more Dana Holgerson. Now, Syracuse has a new coach. Oregon State has a new coach. Boise State, San Diego State, and UNR. Wow. This one's chopped. High to the left side. Grabbed by O'Sullivan. The feed to the base. At second is in time. The throw to first is there. A 5-4-3 around the horn. Double play. O'Sullivan to half to Krizik to wrap up the top half of the eighth inning and strand a runner on. Hey, double play huge for the momentum as the Rebels running out of outs. Coming up in the bottom of the eighth, they trail 9-5.
Cole Kitchen back out for a fourth inning of work for Santa Clara as they lead UNLV. Nine to five, entering into the bottom of the eighth. Time running out for the Rebels, trailing by four with just six outs left to give. Kitchen coming in after Kate Pilcher, and he's been rock solid, especially over the last two innings. Misses inside to begin the eighth against Santino Panaro, who's one for three. In the last two innings alone, Kitchen has faced seven batters, retired six of them. Only runner to reach was on a walk as Rodriguez took ball four to lead off the seventh. Panaro ahead two balls and no strikes to lead off the eighth. Outside of a five-batter stretch in the fifth, where Kitchen allowed four runs on three hits and a pair of walks, he has been sterling as he steals a strike on the outside. Two and one, the count to Santino Panaro. 66 pitches coming into this inning. Be interesting to see how long they'll try to stretch him out for as there is a right-hander warming up in the Bronco dugout, or bullpen. Panaro takes high to move the count to a hitter-friendly three and one. He drove in a pair on a base hit back up the middle with two strikes. And the base is loaded in his most recent plate appearance in the fifth. He takes a bouncing ball in the dirt for ball number four. Panaro reaches for the second straight plate appearance. And the Rebels able to put their second straight leadoff hitter on via the walk. And in fact, it's the only way they put a leadoff runner on. Three runners have let off an inning by reaching. And they've all been via the base on balls. After a leadoff walk, here comes the head coach, Rusty Filter, as he'll go to the pen. And in the bottom of the eighth with the Rebels down nine to five, leadoff runner on is Bailey Seeger, the first batter to come up against the new arm into the game. We'll tell you all about him coming up next. With one on and nobody out in the home half of the eighth inning, six foot three, 215 pound right hander Max Bales, the freshman out of San Diego, up against Bailey Seeger, the native Colorado, where he has Santino Panaro on first in a nine to five game. Rebels looking for some late offense. He's trying to spark a comeback bid. Bales, who's into the game for the seventh time this year, starts out ahead. Dealing a fastball, called for strike one to Bailey Seeger, who is 0 for 3. He's ended each inning in which he's come to bat prior. Physically impossible here with nobody out and one on. Bales out of the stretch. Seeger swings and misses, and he's behind nothing in two. Gets the right-hander with a 3-0 record. 3-8-6 ERA to go along with the save. 
over 11 and two-thirds innings, 18 strikeouts, six walks. Opponents batting 154 against him, although two of the six hits he's given up have left the yard. Seeger, with a pair of home runs on the year, takes a bouncing ball, missing for ball one to move the count one and two. Seeger has grounded out, lined out, and struck out. Good, by, good job by the Bronco catcher Steck right there. Keep that ball in front of him as that ball bounced about five feet in front of him. Panaro was looking to roll, but Steck did a good job coming up with that. Bales set and dealing on one, two. Outside on the slider, count goes even. Bales, the third pitcher used for Santa Clara today. Cole Kitchen, who is the pitcher of record as of now, to this point charged for four runs on four hits and three walks over three innings of work. Santino Panaro off first, charged to him if he were to come around and score. Seeger fists one straight back. And the foul ball keeps the count at two and two. Seeger, good numbers on the year as a whole, but struggling offensively today. It was Seeger in the lineup catching last night, one for three, and the Rebels five to nothing win. Broncos turning the tide to this point. As a check swing foul ball, straight back keeps the count at two and two. Probably a good job right there. That ball was over the plate. So you're able to get a piece of that one. With the count two and two here, New pitcher coming in in Bales. Probably going to get something in the zone right now because he doesn't want to go full count coming off, off the bench. Panaro off first. Here's the 2-2 two -two to Seeger. Swung on, popped up straight back. Another foul ball to stay alive by Bailey Seeger, the New Mexico transfer, although he did not play for the Lobos in his only season in Albuquerque last year. Bales coming in at 90-91 to 91 with his fastball right now. Two-pitch guy. Slider and fastball. Just a freshman. That's a big body for a freshman as Seeger hits one high foul and out of play. Down the first base side, Bales every bit of six foot three and 215 pounds. Pretty much seen Seeger going to take over most of the work behind the plate for the Hustlin' Rebels. Early in the year, it was kind of by committee, but he's kind of settled into that spot. Yeah, commanding more starts because of the bat. He checks his swing, and yes, he did, says the home plate umpire Joseph Pena. As Seeger with a couple of parting words as he departs the right-hand box and heads back to the dugout. Second time he's struck out in as many at-bats. Meanwhile, that's the 19th strikeout in 12 innings for Max Bales on the year. One out, one on for Myro. Batting out of the ninth spot today, nothing for two. Last time out for Bales was on the 9th of March against UC Davis. Went three innings and a loss as he deals high. Bales took a no decision, giving up two runs on two hits, two walks, and four strikeouts over three innings in an 8-6 to six Aggie win over the Broncos. Calls time and steps off the back of the mound. And Myro back in from the right-hand box. Throw over to first base, a lightly lofted throw as Bonaro dives back in head first and safely. Santino yet to attempt a steal on the year. That was awfully close to a pitching violation right there. 15 second pitch clock timer going off as Bales deals. Myro lifts one to right center field, fading towards the grass and it drops for a base hit. Paul Myro reaching for the second time today, advancing Santino Bonaro up from first to second. And down by four, you just need base runners. And base runners the UNLV Rebels have here with two on and one down. And the top of their lineup due up. For Myro, that's exactly what you need to just reach any way to set up the top of the lineup with a couple of runners on. Yeah, good piece of hitting right there. Just gets a bat out in front, drops that into shallow right center. Get the top of the lineup going, get a lefty-righty matchup here. First pitch to Charles, fouled straight back. He has been uber aggressive on the first pitch of every at bat so far and we've seen that this season so far it's something that he's really seeing or just feeling comfortable with going up there and being aggressive he's choked up on the bat from the left side he swings at the second pitch also fouls it off it's off his foot yeah, as he jogs down the first base line to run that one off he's behind quickly nothing in two he grounded out to first in the first popped out to center in the third doubled and scored in that four run fifth inning and then fly it out to right to end the sixth. Charles, one of the few players that does not wear an elbow shield or any type of foot protection either. Although he does have the hand guard for when he reaches base in that back left pocket. Seeing that more nowadays. 
as he takes a bouncing ball blocked by Steck. Yeah, the, the guards becoming, you know, regular in baseball. I saw clips of a, a seven-year-old hitting home runs with one of them on yesterday. I think that might be a little mm. young. The, the hand guard is a new one as well. Looks yeah. like It looks like the oven yeah. mitt. That's a... I'm going to put that one on the parent. Yeah. Well, you know, my dad, good example, growing up, I, I can already tell you if I would have asked for one, hey, I, when I get on base, I need a hand guard. He goes, well, let's worry about getting you on base Correct. first. That's exactly what he would have said. <laughs> Probably still would say to me to this That's day. That's why I love your dad. <laughs> the one, two, Charles hits one high in the air, playable to left. Back goes Lewis. He stops. He settles underneath, makes the catch moving back in towards the infield. And fires it all the way to third base on one hop, clearing the cutoff man as Charles skies out to left for route number two. Back to second is Panaro. Back to first is Myro. I saw an interesting clip, social media. Dad throwing a young youngster, probably nine or ten years old, and dad's throwing some BP, and the kid takes one over the fence, flips his bat. The <laughs> next pitch, the dad dusted him. It was awesome. It was something my dad would have done. You teach him young. Yeah, J.P. Heff stands in now, takes the first pitch, curveball off the outside, yeah. I think my dad would have actually made me go home if I flipped the bat <laughs> We're on done, him. we're done. We're done. That reminds me of, uh, you know, I would ask to uh, switch hit as a kid because everybody wants to be like a, like a Chipper Jones. It's this pitch outside. Uh, the classic line that I still tell people to this day, I grew up batting left-handed, wanted to turn it around and bat righty. My dad said, when you learn to bat left-handed, Efficiently, yep. then you can turn it around. Case in point, I've never batted right in my life. <laughs> the 2 0 inside and Heft moves ahead three balls and no strikes with Isaac Rodriguez, who has taken a ton of balls on deck. When you look at the specialization of baseball now, these kids are playing year round, only one sport. This pitch up and into Heft. It's called for ball four to low the bases. That brings up Rodriguez as the tying run with two outs in the eighth. You know, there's some kids that are, are really good, and they're going to be phenoms. You look at Bryce Harper. He, yeah. was, he was a year-round guy when he was a youngster and got into the high school level and the junior college level here, and you, you knew he was going to be the, the guy. He was yeah. a phenom. But I just think that parents are shorting their kids when they're not having them play multiple sports as they're younger, even on the entry into high school. The rule in my house was, and I coached for so many years, football and wrestling, you had to you had to play three sports your freshman and sophomore year. If you wanted to specialize after that, that was on you. Here's Rodriguez, who takes ball one. He has walked three times and been hit by a pitch on the hand as well. And didn't stop my sons from getting co college scholarships. So something was working. Something was working. <laughs> Here's the 1-0. Rodriguez watching all the way. He takes a strike to even the count. Well, I mean, for the majority of, you know, young athletes, that's exactly what they should be is athletes, not young baseball players, because the, there's so many skills that translate Correct. across sports. You got to talk about, you know, basketball for middle infielder. Mm -hmm. This one's pulled foul. That lateral movement side to side greatly benefits you in baseball. There's elements of football. There's elements of hockey, especially, you know, track and field, for God's sake. I was always <laughs> big on having track and field be your second or third sport. It's going to help you everything you do. Rodriguez waves and misses at strike three, touched up by the catcher, Ben Steck. The Rebels strand all three runners on base, unable to get anything going, and they're running out of time. Top of the ninth upcoming, it's Santa Clara 9, UNLV 5.
Top of the ninth inning here on St. Patrick's Day at Early Wilson Stadium. Seven, eight, nine hitters due up for Santa Clara, who lead it nine to five. Malcolm Williams against Will Girardi, who's back out for a second inning of work and falls behind the leadoff batter. One ball, no strikes. Williams, one for three, a base hit, a stolen base. He's also reached on an error and scored a run along with a strikeout and a walk. Girardi, who got through the eighth in four batters over 13 pitches, misses high and away, two balls and no strikes. The efficiency aided greatly by a 5-4-3 double play that Will Joyce tapped into to end the inning. On 2-0, Williams watching all the way, takes a called ball three from Girardi. And with Jordan Lewis on deck, Williams ahead, three balls to no strikes. We've talked about it over the broadcast this year. Four point or four run lead for Santa Clara. That four run lead is not insurmountable. That fifth run in the bottom of the ninth is really hard to come back from. Girardi with a strike over the outside to move the count three and one. Yeah. And I it, think it's something mental. It takes right? out the ability to tie the game on one swing. Sure. It's like, you know, the difference between a three and a four point deficit in basketball. Line drive up the middle, diving is J.P. Haft as he stabs it on a backhand effort for out number one, a hard hit ball, but a better reaction from Haft at second base, moving up the middle. Haft got a good break on that ball towards second base, behind the bag, able to come up with that one. Doesn't have to leave his feet, but heck of an effort. So we're going to get a coaching change right here from Coach Stolte. So with a couple of right-handers upcoming and Lewis, and Cleary, Stan Stolte is going to go to the bullpen. You would assume for a righty. Again, the uh, protected wall down in the dugout, or the bullpen, beg your pardon, prevents us from seeing who is warming up until they actually emerge onto the field of play. As we have a body coming out. And it is number 41, Albert Robles. Robles replacing Girardi in the top of the ninth inning. We'll step aside as he gets loose. Santa Clara leads it 9-5. to five. Here's the right-hander, Albert Robles, into the game with one out, nobody on top of the ninth inning. Robles replacing Girardi after an inning and a third. Girardi giving up a hit and a walk, but zeros elsewhere as he kept the score at 9-5. to five. Robles spins a slider across the plate for a called strike to Jordan Lewis, the junior out of Moreno Valley, California, 1-2, and two, with a 12-6-6 ERA that he'll look to lower this afternoon. This is the first relief appearance for Robles of the year, and he gives up a high fly ball deep to left field. Back into the corner goes Santino Panaro on the move. Santino makes the catch at the chest. He had to cover plenty of ground while shaded away from the line initially, but Santino Panaro reaching out on a running grab for out number two in the ninth. I'm not going to read too much into this one, but Robles has been the Saturday starter mm -hmm. for the Rebels. After his first, in, uh, first outing of the year, really dominating... Bradley pitching, this uh, may be an indication he's going to be moving into a bullpen role. Ben Cleary batting with two outs and nobody on in the 
top half of the ninth inning as he takes an overhand curveball for a ball. Do you think there's an element as well of because of the rainouts and the moved games, they're just trying to make sure the Robles get some work this weekend, or you think it may be a potential actual move? I think uh, just given the fact that his last few outings have been tough, and that's not to say he's not going to be a starter again, or again, I'm pure speculation yeah. at this point, but they might be trying to build him up some confidence coming out of the bullpen to work back into that starting role later in the year. He's behind 2-0 to Cleary, who's one for three today. Now 3-0 and as he misses low with a fastball. It wouldn't surprise me if at some point we're going to see Jesus Gonzalez move into the starting role. Yeah, he's been outstanding, basically exclusively coming in behind Austin Cates. 3-0 fastball right down the chute for a call, strike one. And the Rebels do have a, uh, a lot of depth as far as guys to come in and start maybe a midweek game, give you some innings. Robles certainly profiles in there as he has been starting all year. Line drive hit past Hept at second base in the shallow right field as Cleary reaches for the third time today, second time via a hit. And a two-out knock brings up John John Baring at the top of the lineup. Yeah, Robles knocked around against New Mexico in his last outing on the ninth. Got one out and a start. Gave up nine runs, eight earned, and got worse from there as that was the 31-15 final in Albuquerque. Bearing at the top of the lineup, one for four. One for five, beg your pardon. This is his sixth plate appearance of the game. Anna Clara has had runners on all day as Robles fires a fastball. Overhand delivery in there for strike one. You know, hopefully Robles can gain some confidence back after giving up a shellacking like that. That can that can devastate you. You just got to forget about it. It's like being a defensive back in, in football. You just got to go on to the next opportunity. Barring hits one in the air to right center field. Over into the gap is Kate Higgins. Right fielder's got it for out number three. Robles gives out gives up a two out base hit but returns three outs otherwise and that'll give the Rebels one singular job in the bottom of the ninth inning. They need four to tie, five to walk it off and win it. Kate Higgins leads it off. We'll see if they can do it when we come back. It all comes down to this. In the bottom of the ninth inning, the Rebels trail 9-5, to five, although they send a heart of their lineup up in Kate Higgins, Austin Krizik, and Brendan O'Sullivan, the middle three hitters in the lineup. Begin with Kate Higgins as he takes strike one from Max Bales, who came in with a runner on and nobody out in the eighth, got all three outs over a five-batter stretch. He works quickly and misses off the outside to Kate Higgins. Higgins, no batting gloves as he stands in from the left side, Bales gives up a high fly, foul and out of play down the left field line. And the count one and two to Higgins, who's two for four today. If he can find a way on, it changes the complexion of this inning entirely. Oh, absolutely. Got options at that point. He takes outside on the changeup from Bales. Count two balls and two strikes. Higgins took a call third strike in the seventh from Cole Kitchen, as he did in the first from Cade Pilchard. 
Higgins pulls one foul. Count stays two and two. This is a situation where I don't think Bales is going to offer up any fastballs in the zone. He's going to try to keep things away or down and in on Higgy. Another 2-2. Two -two. His pitch way up and outside. Bales overthrew that one. And the count goes full. No batting gloves on deck either. None needed from Austin Krizik. As the 3-2 on the way from Bales. Higgins hits one high in the air down the left field side over towards the line is Lewis. He stops and is able to make the catch with two hands in front of the chest as Higgins skies out. He's now two for five in a leadoff out of the ninth inning. Coaches say is the most important out of the game and Bale's able to get it relatively easily after an extended at bat. So Krizik batting. Meanwhile, emerging in the on deck circle is Parker Schmidt. Schmidt going to pinch hit and get in that bat here in the ninth inning as Krizik takes a call strike one at the chest. Kriz hitless today, although he does have an RBI on a bases loaded walk in the fifth inning. Backs away from this changeup up by the eyeballs and the count even at a ball and a strike with an out. Krizik has flied out once to each outfielder. He's done it in order as well. Grounds this one to the left side. Backhanded deep in the hole. It's short by Williams and he's able to turn and fire a quick strike to first. Made that throw look easy. It was anything but. And the Rebels down to their final out. It'll be Parker Schmidt trying to extend the game here in the bottom of the ninth. First time we've seen Schmidt in the last two days. Schmidt had been working mostly at the DH spot, but had been playing some left field also. Schmidt, the Utah Tech transfer. No batting gloves either. So... Rebels in the bottom of the ninth setting up three straight hitters. Sands gloves as Schmidt takes high and in. Really doesn't matter, but just kind of a unique instance in today's day and age. Schmidt hitting 318 on the year. No home runs and 10 RBIs. Takes a strike here from Bales to even the count up in one. He has been phenomenal at putting bat on ball. Bales working quickly as he misses inside. Count goes to two and one. Schmidt pinch hitting for O'Sullivan. O'Sullivan over three in relief of Chase Dittmar, who grounded out in his only at bat. Schmidt takes a bouncing fastball from Bales and in a pinch hit at bat with Santino Panaro awaiting on deck. The count, three balls and a strike to Schmidt, wearing number four, a senior from Las Vegas. You almost have to keep the bat on your shoulder here. He does, and he takes ball four high. So Bales, after getting two outs in quick succession on a pop out and a ground out, walks Parker Schmidt with two down, and now it's up to Santino Panaro to try and extend this contest. Nine to five in the bottom of the ninth inning. Yeah, and we talked about Schmidt having his opportunity. He hadn't played yet this series with Alex Pimentel battling a knee injury. Soon to be back in the lineup. I think we'll see a lot more of Schmidt going into the weekend or the midweek and then the weekend against Reno. Well, that ball is going to be thrown Throw away. Throw to first base and there was nobody on the bag. Schmidt around second thinking about third, but... Holding up is a strong throw from the first baseman, Joyce, over to Manzo. Second time we've seen that play today. It'll be charged as a throwing error to the pitcher, Bales. Yeah, it's rare you see that once in a weekend. We've seen it twice in about three innings. Once by Lewick and once by Bales here in the ninth inning. Honestly, up by four, what are you picking off for anyway? With two outs in the bottom of the ninth inning. As Panaro takes a strike, fastball clipping the black of the outside. Bales comes set with Schmidt off of second base. A walk and an error, move him into scoring position. Panaro goes, goes down to a knee, swinging and missing at that slider from Bales, who's been really impressive so far. Six foot three, 215 pound freshman, still with plenty of room to grow in that projectable frame. The 0 2 upcoming to Panaro. He swings and chops it foul on the first base side. That one able to extend the game as Panaro drove in two on a base hit up the middle. Good piece of hitting with two outs and two strikes. Part of that full run fifth inning. Another 0-2. This one chopped on the ground a second. This should do it. Ben Cleary's got it and throws to first. And the Rebels unable to get much going offensively as a big time four spot in the fifth and a three spot in the seventh. Doom them as they fall to Santa Clara 9-5, to five, splitting what turned into a two-game weekend series because of the rainout. The Rebels with five runs on seven hits, 
Three errors, and they left 11 men on base. Santa Clara on the winning line score. Nine runs, 15 hits, no errors. They did leave 10 men on. The damage could have been worse. Kitchen with the win. Cole Kitchen in three innings gave up four runs on four hits. He moves to 2-0. and oh. Sam Simon in a start takes his first loss of the year. Sammy moves to 2-1 and one after giving up a matching four runs in four and a third. We played today's game in three hours and three minutes on St. Patrick's Day. And the Rebels drop to 10-8. and eight. They are now 6-3 and three here at Early Wilson Stadium. The Broncos improve to 11-6. and six. They are now 4-5 and five away from home. Dan, it was an interesting game that involved a, a lot of runners on base. Rebels unable to capitalize on it nearly as much as Santa Clara did. And they dropped their third game overall in the year here at Early Wilson. Truly a tale of two different days, right? Yesterday, phenomenal pitching by the Rebels. Two pitchers coming in shutting down and getting the shutout against the Broncos, hitting timely, no errors. This game didn't get the timely hitting. Pitching was suspect at best at times. Three errors, so that's not a that's not a recipe for success. So the look, Rebels will be looking to bounce back against a very tough St. Mary's program that comes in Tuesday night. The uh, corned beef and cabbage is not going to taste as good as <laughs> I had wanted it to tonight. But nonetheless, good opportunity to come back Tuesday, right the ship, get that, get up to Reno over the weekend and start winning some conference games. Rebels fall 9-5, to five, splitting a weekend series against Santa Clara. Back at it Tuesday evening here at Early Wilson Stadium, 6.05 Pacific, 9.05 Eastern. Myself, Matt Neverett, and Dan Dolby will be on the call. That'll do it for us here from Early Wilson Stadium as the Rebels fall to 10-8 and 6-3 and and at home. We will see you Tuesday night. Have a happy St. Patrick's Day and a safe Sunday evening. Goodbye, everybody.